that we put in the Welcome, everybody, to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight, we'll be covering The Art of War, Chapter 8, and we will have two readings, uh, and then we will go to Jason's translation. Uh, so do I have any volunteers to do the reading? James, thank you. Double apologies. Sun Tzu said, in war, the general receives his commands from the sovereign, collects his army, and concentrates his forces. When in difficult country, do not encamp. In country where high roads intersect, join hands with your allies. <clears throat> Do not linger in dangerously isolated positions. In hemmed in situations, you might resort to stratagem. In a desperate position, you must fight. There are roads which must not be followed, armies which must not be attacked, towns which must not be besieged, positions which must not be contested, commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. The general who thoroughly understands the advantages that accompany variation of tactics knows how to handle his troops. The general who does not understand these may be well acquainted with the configuration of the country yet he will not be able to turn his knowledge to practical account. So the student of war who is unversed in the art of varying his plans, even though he be acquainted with the five advantages. Oh, well, he will fail to make the best use of his men. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else have a different translation? Aman, okay. Unless anybody else has one, I have the Samuel Griffith translation. I I, I can read mine if you don't mind. I don't know. I mean, oh, go right ahead. Uh, let me try this one. I found this one in airport. Okay, when I travel. Okay, so uh, ten dollars. It's here, so pocket book. So you can put in the pocket in the else when you're waiting for the airplane, you can read. So uh okay, so I'm going to read okay, chapter eight. All right, let me see. Uh okay. <clears throat> the general the general rule for military operations is that the military leadership receives the order from the civilian leadership to gather armies. Let there be no encampment on difficult terrain. Let diplomatic uh, a relation be established at borders. Do not stay in barren or isolated territory. When on surrounded ground, plot. When on deadly ground, fight. There are routes not to be followed armies not to be attacked, citadels not to be besieged, territory not to be fought over, orders of a civilian government not to be obeyed. Therefore, generals who know all possible adaptations to take advantage of the ground know how to use military forces. If generals do not know how to adapt advantages, even if they know the day of the land, they cannot take advantage of it. If they rule armies without knowing the art of complete adaptivities, even if they know what there is to gain, they cannot get people to work for them. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so um, today's uh, chapter eight, uh, since it's a little bit, uh, I think it's much shorter in my opinion. So uh, I probably will, uh, okay, so allow me to, so I probably that's a good chance. And this is the chapter eight out of 13. That probably is a good time to kind of do a review from chapter one. So I'll probably take about two, three minutes to review. So right now we are in chapter eight. So uh, chapter one, talking about the plan and the Sun Tzu talk about five things to for the prince that, that will, I will assume the audience talking about the Tao, the heaven, the earth, the general, and the, the method. That's the five elements or five things you need to remember. Second thing, the chapter two, Sun Tzu is talking about waging war and but actually it's not waging the war yet it's just in the planning stage he talked about the money how much money you will spend and then how much money you need to burn during the war so you need to shorten your time of war then chapter three the title is a strategy to attack but basically he's talking about the strategy strategize to attack, not to attack yet. So he talked about keyword is know thyself, know thy enemy. So know yourself, know the other side. That's the way to win. Chapter four, start to talk about the formation and which Sun Tzu want to talk about is to defense, the concept of defense. Make sure you are undefeatable. So you can be in a safe situation. So that finished the first four chapter, then gradually move to the battlefield. Okay, so chapter five start to bring the concept of Shi, which will translate roughly a situation, configuration, power, uh, potential, you know, uh, energy, this kind of word called Shi. And the basics, they use water metaphor, like water flow, okay? Then chapter six, start to talk about the, what is virtual, what is real, because we all deal with incomplete information. So we cannot know everything 100%. So we need to play some pretense so uh, a lot of things you are unknown. So uh, the Sun Tzu is talk about, he used the water metaphor, okay? Like water, you should avoid the strong, attack the weak. That's Sun Tzu's idea. Then chapter seven, which we deal with last week, okay? So basics, it's talking about to form the army under the command from the prince, gathering all the people and then he bring up the concept, two major concepts. One is talking about the qi, right? The military, and we can translate as the spirit. And then Sun Tzu give a lot of metaphor, right? How to like, uh, let me see, uh, 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 move like a wind, right? As uh, 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 gentle, like the forest, you know, all this kind of thing, unmovable like a mountain. So, what kind of military movement you need to do. That's last week. So this week, we start to talk about the variation, okay? Uh, so you can feel if you go through from the uh, uh, previous seven chapters, you will see from the high level going down, 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 down to the today, uh, chapter A is for sure, it's in the battlefield. Like last week, uh, Sun Tzu already talked about two armies, face each other, okay? So look at the title. Uh, I have to, I translate word by word is so-called the nine variations. So some translation call it the adoption, adaptivities, okay? So uh, the word nine is, is strange today uh, for me now, because in uh, ancient Chinese, nine usually means uh, Many, many, okay, or a lot of number, okay. So many variation or just a variation. So that's a good number to use. Nine is a number, ancient Chinese. Even today, people like to use. That's a good number. But here, does that mean 
exactly nine different variations. It could be because I counted, you have nine. And if you read the translation, uh, uh, in this paragraph, Sun Tzu talk about five advantage. And actually, if I counted uh, Sun Tzu list, five advantage of the land and the four not to do list. Okay, so the total is nine. So when the title called nine variations could mean exactly nine. So I'm going to list nine here. So, you know, uh, that, that's the point. So uh, I'm going to read my translation. Um, Master Sun said, in the military operation, the general acts under the order from the prince and forms the army by assembling the people. So here, because Chinese word doesn't have a plural or singular, so I decide to use singular under the order. Okay, uh, I, I will explain later. So uh, assembly. So here, uh, Sun Tzu give five or uh, nine advice, uh, which comp uh, contains five advantages of the land and uh, four not to do. Okay, so. Do not garrison on destroyed land. Form alliance on open land. Do not stay on isolated land. Strategize on encircled land. Fight on desperate land. So here's the five thing about land. Then, then here comes four not to do, something not to do. So some roads not to, some roads do not pass. Some armies do not attack. Some towns do not besiege. Some lands do not strive for. So total is nine. Then come with the last one. Okay, I need some uh, interpretation. Some commands from the prince do not follow. All right. So if you look at this one, it could be contradict from the first one, right? Uh, the at beginning is said, and the same as in the previous chapter, the same as chapter seven, in the military operation, the general acts under the order from the prince. And here he said, some command, some orders from the prince not to follow. So that's why here in Chinese, it all use the word me, means command or order. They are the same word. But I will, at this moment, I will put the first one as singular, the second one as plural, okay? So the idea is this, the general receive the command. Actually, it's only one command, go fight the against country B or country A, this country, okay? So that's one command. The rest, the general only selectively receive, okay? Some commands, okay? So that means after that, after you go to the field, the general is not going to accept all the commands from the prince, okay? So I think that's the key here and then so that's why the first one I will translate as the order, and the, the rest, I, the second one, I translate some commands from the prince do not follow. Okay. So, um, second part. Therefore, the general who thoroughly understands the advantages of nine variations knows military operation. The general who does not thoroughly understand the advantages of nine variations, even though he may be familiar with the configuration of the den, fails to take the advantage of the den. The general who rules the army without knowing the art of nine variations even though he may be familiar with the five advantages of the land, fail to make the best use of the man, okay, of his man. So the last 
paragraph to this part, at least that's ABC. Uh, uh, sounds a little bit lazy, but uh, we need to forgive Sun Zi because he doesn't know logic, doesn't know uh, Aristotelian syllogism, because if you know, they will be much easier because his idea is very simple. You need to know the land and the, 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 he called the five advantage of the land. If you don't know, even you familiar with the land, you cannot best use of your people. That's the simple logic. But since he ha, uh, Sun Tzu has not been trained in logic, so he has to put a little bit dense way. Uh, uh, that, that's the key. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, Amar, please. Thank you, Jason. Um, and thank you for uh, both retaining the alternate that I offer and the explanation for why singular, why plural. Acting under orders was just more colloquially what you'll hear in military parlance, but I understand the, the logic in making sure one is singular and one is plural. Um, I wanted to take advantage, since we did that quick overview, to offer an interpretive over an interpretation of sort of the reason or logic that may be involved here. One of the things that I haven't leaned into very much, but I think I've mentioned once or twice, is that this is a text with a pedagogical agenda. In other words, it's a text designed to teach someone the art of war, to teach them how to be a better actor in terms of military performance. And I do believe there are many layers to the lessons being offered here. But as you can probably tell from the last chapter in this chapter, this feels very much less like lessons being offered to a general to, or excuse me to a prince to someone who would be at the head of a household there's almost something intentionally daunting in sun tzu's use of numbers and logistics and that is i can almost envision handing this text to a prince who reads through the first chapter maybe makes their way into the second chapter by the third chapter they're losing interest and in starting to get just overwhelmed with the details and logistics and by chapter four the expectation is they just hand it to a general they trust and say here you study this and you tell me what's important and then the lessons on the particulars of battle start being divulged it, it's meant to be sort of an exhausting and daunting um curriculum you, you have a great deal to learn to be proficient at this. You have a great deal to understand, to be versed in the art of war. And I think the subtext is to any princeling, you aren't qualified. You just aren't qualified. If you think of all the things that you must do in your position, knowing and understanding and being adept at absolutely all of this is not every it is not in your purview you need someone who you can trust who can be versed and adapt and knowledgeable in all of this and so as i've read through this translation and worked with jason on doing the translation i'm coming to see that there is an intentional sort of blockade or push back for the prince to be the intended audience they should read this just to familiarize themselves with there's a whole lot you don't know that you don't know and now that you've read this you know that there's a whole lot you don't know so hire somebody who knows it and knows it very well and here in chapter eight we start getting into those nuanced nitty-gritty details that probably require some context for somebody to understand if you say don't get or sin on destroyed land you know a prince would be like why is this a bad thing a general who has done it would say, oh, yeah, I can tell you exactly why that's a bad thing. I get this piece of advice. Been there, made to do it. It's horrible. Never do it to my soldiers. So I just wanted to offer that up as sort of the overview of where we are now in into the weeds of battle, as it were. And um, yeah, I'm 
excited to hear your takes on this this particular verse. So folks, uh, go ahead and, and line up to share your thoughts on verse one and chapter eight. So first up, we have David. Yeah, maybe it's just a slight veer at this moment, but what, from what Alan was saying, there is a risk as the prince to handing power over to the military right. because in as much as they're successful, they can also command that power, which if you're not really the one determining it, I mean, there are times uh, when the prince leader actually had to take over control of the army in Chinese history, right? So you can confirm that. Second thing is about the multiple commands, um, the commands from the leadership. It's sort of, maybe it's not a big deal. I mean, you get your orders, order to engage in this process, sort of the strategic goal. But it says down below, there are orders not to follow. So there are, more than, there are some specific orders, more than one, that are being entailed, that are being um, issued, right? And this is saying, um, without determining how, it's telling us there is a primary strategic goal and there are other things, right? So you may want to address that for me. Thanks. Any comments, uh, either Jason or Amon? Yeah, I, I, I can comment this one. Well, in general, you know, I think this word, you know, in Chinese called Jun Min Yosu, so, okay, it's uh, some command from the prince do not follow. It becomes a saying uh, through the history, okay, whenever the general refuse to take the order from the uh, prince from the uh, sovereign, so, uh, sovereign, they will quote this word. Okay, doesn't matter has a good intention or bad intention. A lot of times, it's a bad intention because <laughs> that's his power. Okay, so I, I I think that's not moral teaching here. It's just show you the history here. And I'm not the political expert. I'm not the military expert, and then. I'm more interested in the philosophy. So I just show this one, it's a fine line, this one. And I'd like to share a famous story. And during the warring state, uh, uh, there's a famous general, his name is Bai Qi, okay? So when the Qin, uh, Qin is the state on the West, eventually they conquered all the other state. When Qin, uh, the, 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 the emperor, okay? Ask Bai Qi to take the wage, the military to conquer uh, the, I think it's another powerful state. I think the state of Zhao, I'm not sure. But he takes about a million or two million uh, uh, a military force, which is two thirds of the entire country. So when he go out, you can see this dangerous situation, right? Two thirds of the military power is in one man's hand. So that's a very dangerous situation. So when he out the general out of the field, the emperor constantly sent messenger to ask what's the situation? What are you doing now? What's going on? And anything want to report? Okay. So every time the general send the messenger back to report, always say, oh, you told me you are going to give me a big land. Where's land? I haven't seen it. And the next time you say, oh, you told me you are going to promote my two sons to certain position. I, I, when are you going to do that? Okay, when can I increase my salary? So the assistant from the general tell him, come on, you are the chief, com commander in chief. Why do you make this kind of request? And he said, listen, I have two thirds of military power. If the emperor have any suspect about my loyalty, not only we will lose the war and I will lose my life. So only thing I can do is keep telling the general, the, uh, keep telling the emperor, my boss, my interest is my family. I want to make more money. I want to have my son have a good life. Then we will be safe and then we can win this war. So I think that's a good lesson on uh, 
how to manage your manager. Okay, so I think that's a, a, a important message, and it's a little bit sidetracked, but I think so that's a good way, uh, a chance to respond to what David is talking about. I think Jason has an excellent answer. I only wanted to add a couple of things to it. One of the most classic Chinese novels, The uh, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, is entirely predicated on Liu Bai's refusal to follow his emperor's order most of the way through the book because it ensures his death. And in fact, when he does finally follow the order, the empire falls apart. So it's an, meant as a parable or a lesson in some orders are not to be followed for a very real reason. And it's not always about morality. It can be just about the utilitarian good of all involved. But there is some sort of self-determination element that hinges on morality here, making this almost a proto-Nuremberg trial sort of directive. The I was just following orders is not good enough at least not according to Sun Tzu. Well, I, from what you said, it's it seems important that this book, which becomes a foundational way of evaluating leadership, mm -hmm. itself declares that the general can override the commands. So it's part of the protocol. Like you said, it's built in. You have responsibility to make those decisions at a certain level. Cool. Thank you, David. Uh, so uh, it's Ian next. Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say two things. Um, firstly, that the two translations for the title are either variation or adaptation. I like adaptation more because it seems to suggest that it's a reaction to a situation compared to variation, which might be like a random thing. So I was wondering if variation in that sense is ever used by um Sun Tzu at all in his book like you know like randomizing stuff like guerrilla warfare or whatnot uh thank, thank you yeah uh when you talk about this i kind of agree with you adaptation probably make more sense because uh i I, 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 I'm aware of these two words, okay, when I'm picking this between these two. At that time, I'm thinking about variation because the Chinese word is bian. Bian means change, means variation. So I decide this one. But right now, I kind of think about probably I should use adaptation, okay? The reason is if you take this word, bian, change, as a verb, okay? And then you put the subject as me, okay? If I say I change, right? That means adaptation. So if you put the subject as the land, okay? That means variation. The land has various situations. But you put the subject as me, Jason, the a subject as a person, a general, that means I have to adapt to the land. So. Uh, adaptation could make more sense. And at this, this moment, I'm thinking this one. And that's a show one of the challenge in deal with ancient Chinese because there's no subject. So you really have to see, uh, to guess what the subject, you know, to be. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, and that yeah. led me to my question, which was, um, it was, is there any sense of like pure variation in, in his book at all or or in any of his subsequent writings where it's like you know he just does random stuff he's, does he ever employ that at all because uh like in, in in the rules that you said it's like don't garrison on destroyed lands it's like it's a reaction to something right but does he ever do stuff randomly like um like guerrilla warfare or are you? Yeah, guerrilla or like, um, I don't know, like surprise tactics. Does he ever delve on those in any of the other chapters? I don't think so. I don't know, you know among or anybody. Uh, has, uh, I would say that there is a 
subtext, not a subtext, but yes, there there is certainly not not what we would think of as guerrilla warfare today, but there is the notion that you must out strategize and outsmart your enemy, and that um, you shouldn't present them with all of your force right up front for them to assess. You should give them something to observe that they leads them to a given impression and then have something or a unit in reserve to actually make an attack. So there is this notion of, you know, subterfuge being of absolute premium value in battle. Um, he never just comes out and says, you know, go out and wing it. I, I don't think oh, Sun Tzu, okay. I think Sun Tzu could not stomach <laughs> that idea. But um, there is an idea of adaptability. And as Chris was kind enough to point out, the word bin shows up several times in the text under many different subjects from uh, to the weak points and strong points to maneuvering. Um, it, it comes up in many of the different uh, verses, but each of them have their own unique context. But does, okay. does he talk about surprise moves in the sense of Keep unexpected things, always keep them jostled and use small groups in ways yeah. to you know, get yeah. around to their weak points and just keep them constantly flustered. So I, kind of. Yeah, I, yeah th thank you, David. I, I think you are right. That's exactly how I would like to say this one. And then uh, also thank you, Ian. Let me think about all things. I think this one you can see as a reaction. Sun Tzu writing this one as a react to the traditional war. Right, the traditional. I think same as in Europe, right? The during the American Independence War, we have the same situation. Uh, the British Army is using the uh, the traditional gentleman's game, where the red coat line up and then you know one by one. Uh, instead, uh, versus America, use a, a, a different way. Same as Sun Tzu's reaction, because before Sun Tzu's time. Uh, the war could be like aristocratic uh, a soldier, and they are all noble people. They, it's a gentleman's game. They form up very small scale. But during Sun Tzu's time, because the development, the economic development, and the, the scientific development, the tool of uh, iron, uh, so people, you can wage like millions of people. I don't know really have a million or not, but basically you can uh, draft the regular people and they have the mass army. And during this time, it's no more gentleman's game. So his writing could be a reaction to the uh, uh, a traditional uh, warfare. Thank you for that explanation. Yes, I was actually uh, also thinking about the use of smaller groups, but also the use of information. Uh, as well is very important when we're thinking about this. Sun Tzu talks about uh, essentially acting on, on good information using uh, spies. Uh, so I, I think that that's, uh, you're not necessarily going to act with uh, in a more spontaneous way uh, if you uh, have advanced information about the enemy. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, James. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's chapter one. Basically, he says all war is by deception. Chapter three is uh, all about strategies, including uh, always wait for your opponent to uh, be to not be ready. Whenever your opponent is ready, that's the time to attack. So there's an awful lot of uh, ideas of deceit and um, uh, invoking strategy on the opponent, if you read carefully um, in the early chapters. Um, in this this chapter, I really like uh, the, the the idea of the eight, the nine, which turns out to be ten uh, recommendations. Um, so uh, the uh, so Sun yeah Sun Tzu has a lot of that kind of advice that we shouldn't uh, that we shouldn't uh, actually end up uh, being the ones that don't look out for opportunities, the ones that fight from a disadvantage because we're not thinking ahead of the enemy. 
the uh, and this is the idea what we the modern word for that is guerrilla warfare you know uh, like even talks about flanking the enemy troops so as to uh, give them give them problems you know like uh, that would be uh, flanking the enemy would be so sort that's of the easiest way to uh, reduce their reduce their numbers. Uh, I like uh, the the the, co the form of this, the uh, the uh, the land kind of idea, and then the the four um, the four do nots afterwards are kind of uh, all objects. I notice uh, roads, some roads don't, some armies don't, some towns don't, some lands don't. You know, in other words, be discreet. Use discretion, as you say. And this all goes. So this is also goes for uh, a prince who is uh, micromanaging. If you have, he's not saying disobey all the orders from the from the sovereign or anything like that. He's just saying, you know, look, look out if in case you've been micromanaged, or maybe the the prince and you worked out a plan together. And 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 your plan was to do this: go into the town, go down to the field, uh, try to gain dominance in the hills, or something like that, right? And then when you were actually in situation, you knew what you needed to do, and it was not necessarily according to the plans that had been made beforehand, either by the prince or, you know, by by uh, by a committee in conjunction. So, or by a military committee in, in, in conjunction. So now the general is in charge and the general has to make the, the ultimate decisions of what uh, to do and what not to do. So that's the, uh, so I think that's what this section is about. Um, the, the intelligence of the general, the fine, the fine, fine tuning of the decisions of the, of the, of the um, general. So uh, yeah, so, what another great idea from Sun Tzu. And thank you for that, James. I think that, that that's a very important point. Sometimes the most important thing is to know what not to do. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of times in, in any situation that we can think about, um, we could apply that to, um, you know, I keep coming back to some types of business ideas, but uh, having, you know, there's, there's certain rules where you just don't necessarily get outside of your, uh, area of expertise you, instead of growing organically sometimes. Um, so anyway, thank you for that. Um, and. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm starting to, uh, think, and I don't know if others would agree that, uh, you know, the notion of the prince as the intended audience was put for put forth. And I'm just really starting to instead see this text as um, being sort of a training manual for, you know, upper level officers. Um, I, I think that the prince, um, I, I think even back in chapter one, um, no, I can't quote it. But uh, that this the the prince is sort of asserted as a a a textual sort of an, a respectful nod, but I think eventually, uh, immediate almost immediately, we're talking about the people who are really on the ground. You know, the earth plays a a big role, as we know throughout the test uh, the text. It's a theme in terms of high ground, low ground. You know, cities and so on and so forth. So I think these this you know unless somebody else can provide so, uh, you know an alternate opinion and point to some evidence, I think this is actually not even uh, intended to be read by the prince at all. Um, sorry, and let me respond to your question, and I'm going to provide evidence on <laughs> chapter one. Okay, uh, if you read the chapter one and then uh, on the paragraph four, he talk about uh, he talk about seven comparisons something like so. Uh, 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 the Sun Tzu said, appointing the general who follow my plan leads to victory, retain him. 
appointing appointing the general who doesn't follow my plan leads to defeat, dismiss him. So I, I, I have to assume, okay, that's who is the boss of the general. This must be the prince, right? And then in this chapter eight, he said some command from the prince do not follow. So the audience could not be the prince, it must be the general. So that's why here, if you compare these two chapters, the audience must change. Otherwise, we will say you conflict yourself. So you know, that, that's the, my evidence. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, so uh, appointing the commander, repeat the, the quote from the text, Jason, please. Okay, appointing. that's my translation. Okay, so uh, uh, the last two words, okay, is appointing the general who follows my plan leads to victory, okay? Retaining well, my Okay, well, my understanding is Sun Tzu, the master, is a general. Oh, but, uh, he's so he's, well, well, he the is- The master said, appointing my, and so then in that case, he's become schizophrenic <laughs> and he <laughs> attains to be the uh, Lord, the emperor, the, what, you know, emperor. <laughs> But, uh, I think you make a very good point, but uh, I have no answer on that because some, uh, well, definitely if I'm the prince, I say, okay, shut up, okay, you are fired, okay? So that's a way to do it. But uh, I will assume during that time, uh, because people are fighting, the prince, princes, okay, different country, different state are fighting for talent. So for the talent, if they recognize they were, the prince will listen. So I will assume when Sun Tzu speak of this word, he doesn't put himself of the general or the general in the battlefield. He's talking about the chief advisor to the, his, his role is the chief advisor, chief military advisor to the prince, okay? And he could be appointed as a general later on. I don't know, but you know, I, I have to assume that's his position. Thank you for that, Jason Kwan. Um, I want I wanted to make another comment, but I this question of the prince interests me very much. So I would like to add something about that. Uh, let's not forget that historically, uh, Sun Tzu gave this treatise to a prince called King He Lu of the Wu Principality or even the Wu Kingdom. So he has been introduced to that King He Lu of the Wu Kingdom, corresponding more or less to the Jiangsu province nowadays, a part of Zhejiang and part of Jiangsu province. And uh, his, his friend Wu Zisu presented him to that king. And that king has been impressed by his book and used his book as a base to conquer the kingdom of Chu to the west of the Wu Kingdom, okay? Uh, so that is the historical proof that it has been written first and foremost for, for the prince. And for the uh, for the comment about the fact that why would that would why the phrase that uh, the general in a special situation should not listen to the prince cannot be addressed to the king or the prince? Well, I beg to differ because <laughs> I think that a king or sovereign would be wise to be informed that sometimes uh, his military leaders would not listen to him. So I think it's not so absurd than that to have that kind of phrase in a book destined for a sovereign. <laughs> uh, that would be called mutual deniability. Well, that would be, well, first I would like to say that that book has been written for the ruling class of ancient China, okay? And within that ruling class, you have the sovereigns, you have the, the, the lords, you have the generals, but let's not forget it was uh, her hereditary aristocracy. So uh, those people were in the same family or they were cousins, okay? So even if some of them were at the apex and others were at the middle, uh, they more or less the same universe. So most of them, those who had ambitions and talents and uh, intelligence would read the same books independently of their exact position at a certain time. Uh, after all, some very humble cousins because they were uh, clever enough managed to get the throne. So, uh, 
uh, it's, it's in the same universe of aristocrats anyway. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say is about the word the Chiu Pian, okay? Chiu Pian, Chiu, nine, nine variations or nine tactics. Nine in Chinese can mean nine, the number nine, or can mean many, okay? So uh, it, is, uh, it is certain that it can be uh, translated as adaptations. I'm absolutely uh, in agreement with that. Uh, however, if you count the number of stuff that Sun Tzu uh, recommended not to do, they are exactly nine too. So uh, it can be uh, translated as nine variations. It, it would not be a big mistake for me in the sense that there are nine specific situations that the general need to give his attention to if he, don't, he doesn't want to fall into the typical traps, if you know, uh, if you want. And maybe another word that would, could be interesting as a, a substitute or for adaptation, which is a very good translation, uh, adaptation, but it could be transformation too. It's in the sense that uh, you have to uh, transform yourself in your mind and in your behavior uh, according to the movement or the uh, subterfuges of the enemy. So anyway, adaptations is very good, of course. I finish here. Thank you, Juan. Uh, Carl, you added your hand up a couple of times. Uh, do you want to share anything? My thoughts keep racing. Thank you. No, I do like the um, the term adaptation and then Quan's point actually of transformation. I think these are sort of imperative for um, looking at how one thinks about warfare. And my book, um, same translation, but it has some commentary about how even the imperial wishes must be subordinate to military necessity. So going back to the, the earlier chapters about how you think about uh, maneuvering and weak points and strong points and keeping your plans dark and impenetrable and such is very much about how that is executed, which may go against um, commands from sovereigns that are not there in the field, et cetera. And that, that I think Quan's point about the hierarchy um, from aristocrats that can understand in theory what it says but the actual practice of those that are in battle supersedes um, what somebody may decide from afar. That's all. All right. Um, I, mean, I also think about the means of communication at this time. So uh, I'm going to ask the next three people to be very brief uh, with the comments uh, because it's 8.57 and we're only getting on to number, first number two. So uh, please uh, just be very brief. And, uh, go ahead, James. I just wanted to mention that this book uh, is a one of a kind. It's not, it's not, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know there's a 19th century book that's pretty important for the, uh, for the military, but the, the, at the time this, this was written, this was a revolution. This is a revolutionary book. This is a, uh, there's no, there wasn't, the, the, I, 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 doubt, I really doubt that the level of Chinese understanding of warfare preceded Sun Tzu. I think uh, he he basically was encapsulating his own expertise as a as a seasoned leader uh, and uh, as a person who dedicated himself to the understanding of strategy and tactics of warfare uh, in his uh, in you know in his study. So I, I, I there there's there's uh, this is this book is basically unparalleled. There were military accomplishments that came. Uh, with uh, by the Greeks, I started starting with the Greeks and Romans. Yeah, there were some really interesting things that happened there, and uh, and a lot of smaller things that happened in other societies. But this, uh, but this, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Alexander the Great. But this, this is uh, this is for the time it occurred. This book was written. This is unparalleled. So I just wanted to emphasize that this is not this is not ordinary chatting about. How did the how did the battle go or stuff like that? This is the uh, essential essential wisdom on warfare. I agree with that. Thank you, thank you, James. Uh, then we have uh, Johnny, then followed by Ann, and then we'll go, we'll be moving on to number two. Uh, <clears throat> you have to pardon me. I'm in my art studio, <laughs> so this is, and then I'm in art school. So anyway, so kind of messy back here. Uh, you know, I. I used to work with UPS and management and uh, the uh, awesome part of my life 
one thing I under, I learned in their management was there were managers who did exactly what they wanted, which in a which worked fine when there wasn't weren't a lot of problems. But when there were problems, it was the managers, it was the employees who were trying to achieve the goal, but had to do it differently than they were told to do. Those were the people you could count on because the manager, the, the, the general manager would not be in the building asleep. And it was those managers everyone looked to who could make the goal happen and even better who found a way to do it that perhaps was not by the book, but legal, you know, uh, you know, not the way we were ordered to do it, but we had to find ways to make those numbers work. And the ones who followed the orders, but the numbers didn't work, they were out of there. You know, the ones who could, who could uh, judge the situation and, and act and achieve the numbers and the management uh, that was needed, uh, those people rose up you know those are the people who uh knew what the uh, people above them wanted and, mm -hmm. and even when they were given orders underneath all that they uh understood why the orders were there and they had to achieve the order and, but they had an overall look of everything as well they could be trusted to make those decisions those are the ones who rose higher those are the ones who eventually would make the higher choices and it go down. That's yeah. how you grew in the ranks. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks. Yeah, very much. Thank you. Appreciate that comment. Um, uh, Anne, please. Yeah, I like the variation word because it suggests in some biological sense an emergent mm. um, and various um, situation. Adaptation to me suggests a static moment yeah, you know, a static uh, moment relative to the earth, like you can just pin it down and suddenly you can adapt to the new situation. I don't, I don't think that's what's suggested in the text. There are lots of uh, suggestions, again, of the earth and um, uh, what have you. Anyway, thanks. Very good point, actually. I, I like that, uh, especially when you're talking about terrain. Yeah, emergent and generative. Generative are the two words that, uh, yeah, sorry about that. That's a very, very good point. I uh, appreciate that a great deal. Um, so uh, next we'll go to verse two uh, and we will lead with, uh, if you'd be so kind, James. Or if you don't mind. Or... Sorry about that. Hence, in the wise leader's plans, considerations of advantage and disadvantage will be blended together. If our expectation of advantage be tempered in this way, we may succeed in accomplishing the essential part of our schemes. If, on the other hand, in the midst of difficulties, we are always ready to seize an advantage we may extricate ourselves from misfortune. Reduce the hostile chiefs by inflicting damage on them, make trouble for them, and keep them constantly engaged. Hold out specious allurements and make them rush to any given point. Thank you, James. Uh, so next up uh, would be either Jason or Amon. Uh, Amon or, or Jason, do you want to? I can certainly it? read the Griffith if you like. Did you yeah. want to read yours? Oh, okay. okay. Uh, let me see. Finding place is always tricky. Especially and with for this. Yeah, and he starts off the, the section with and. And for this reason, the wise general in his deliberations must consider both favorable and unfavorable factors. By taking into account the favorable factors, he makes his plan feasible. By taking into account the unfavorable, he may resolve the difficulties. 
He who intimidates his neighbors does so by inflicting injury upon them. He wears them, he wearies them by keeping them constantly occupied and makes them rush about by offering them ostensible advantage. I Thank you for that. I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, Jason. Yeah, the rates are very short. So, um, okay, just one minute. It's good because we spent an hour on the first one. Yeah, it's a. a because I follow the um, the the, the C text, uh, so like the past three only have one sentence. So, okay. so um, I think this it's very difficult to translate on um, this paragraph. I have to say, but uh, but the reward is not that big because they probably not a lot of new lesson to learn from this. So. Uh, most are just the word in. Okay. The, the, the challenge here, if you listen to uh, two different translations, you're probably not sure what they mean in the first paragraph. Uh, the, the interest word he soon to use, he talk about za, which means mix up. The advantage, disadvantage, uh, so I think the reason, I just have to impose my reason on that to make sure the whole uh, sentence, um, uh, uh, paragraph makes sense. So the first one, therefore, the wise man's consideration are always branded with both advantages and disadvantages, okay? And uh, I have to put the printings because I assume it's expecting disadvantage in this situation, right? In the advantage, advantageous situation, you have to expect the disadvantage. And in the disadvantageous situation, you have to seize the advantages. I think that's the uh, Sun Tzu want to talk on this sentence. So, it, the, the wise man's consideration are always branded with both advantages and disadvantages. In the advantageous situation, he can succeed in his accomplishment because he expect, ex, he expect that some disadvantages may come, right? In the disadvantageous situation, he can resolve his misfortune because he can seize the advantage, okay, opportunity. So I, I have assumed that's the situation uh, to make sense, to make this sentence make sense. Okay. So uh, therefore, so here use the word, use the zhu hou. Uh, I think the Quan will be happy uh, because I used the word feudal lord. I think that probably the suit, suitable <laughs> uh, words, not something like a chieftain or something. Okay. So therefore, suppress uh, feudal lords by inflicting damage on them. Use feudal laws, uh, use, feud, use the feudal laws by making trouble for them. Entice feudal laws by providing perceived gains. Okay, because that's the situation during the warring state and they have the many uh, feudal laws, or you want to call warlords, okay? They all competing for something, benefit for their own family or their own state. So when you, when the country A fight against country B, they have other state, country C, D, E, F, G, H, they all surrounded to see what kind of opportunity they can take during this time. So Sun Tzu is talking about a more, more diplomatic situation, right? So he used a few words in Chinese, very difficult to translate. First word is qi, okay, qi zhu hou, okay. So you want to uh, 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 suppress some feudal laws, okay, by damaging them. So don't come, otherwise you got something, right? E, okay, that's the word among probably a different opinion, should be, means enslaved, 
but it will be very strange if you want to enslave other feudal law. So I kind of call it use or you know, uh, the feudal laws by making trouble for them. So cause some trouble, so they you can drive other neighboring state to different situation. So the one Qi, I think uh, amongst translation call it uh, make them rush, right? So I kind of consider as entice or uh, 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 the feudal laws by providing some gains. So the second paragraph is talking about when you fighting against your enemy, they have the other so-called neutral states, okay? You need to manage it because they are not really neutral. They have their own purpose in their mind. So three way, one is suppress them, use them, okay? Rush them, you know, push them to the some direction. I think that's Sun Tzu, I guess. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. Um... Again, I, I am always grateful when you keep some editorializing in there. Um, and for anyone who didn't read it, use is actually very apropos for the term E. But in this context, to use feudal lords sounds instrumental. And the context of what he's saying is to put them to use, to make them do your bidding, which is why I offered a very archaic word, insurf, which is not quite the same as enslave. It's a little softer ball than that, but it does mean to put them into your service. Um, and that was really the one sort of, I won't even say disagreement, but editorialized suggestion I offered. I think Jason's translation, is excellent i i love suppress for chew i loved um entice as an idea to make them you know rush towards whatever they perceive as a game um and yes this is a pretty pithy uh verse but it does feel like somebody was saying in the uh chat kind of morse codish expect disadvantages in the advantageous situation and succeed in accomplishments seize advantages and disadvantages situations and resolve misfortunes that does almost read like a double take wait i'm sorry what what am i supposed to do again i'm supposed to find advantage in the disadvantageous situation i'm supposed to find uh the the expected disadvantages in an advantageous situation I, but this really is that old you know expect for the unexpected understand the fog of war don't don't mistake certainty with confidence because you should be confident in your plan you should be confident in your troops in your training but you should not be so certain of them as to misread the winds when they change on you. Thank you, Aman. Uh, very much appreciate that. Yeah, I also agree with this. Don't be overconfident. And uh, in a way, I also get the obstacle of the way as well <laughs> out of this passage as well. Uh, so, uh, Quan. Uh, maybe there's a two verb uh, that are very simple that can be used uh, to subjugate. Uh, or to dominate. Uh, and um, I agree with uh, everyone saying that this paragraph probably gives a very big lesson. Never, never be sure that you are winning <laughs> because uh, there's some always something unexpected. <laughs> and when you think you're winning, maybe uh, the fact that you can see some disadvantages can give you some moderation and avoid you the very grave mistake of hubris. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you the one part that, uh, at least in the, this, uh, the translation um, that I'm reading right now, is that the uh, essential part of our schemes, and I'm trying to parse out what essential actually 
means in that particular instance um because that's kind of critical uh as far as understanding what the um things I mean we've talked a little bit about what not to do in the previous passage uh but what is the essence of what is being said here strategically is a little bit ambiguous to me so uh with that we'll go to David Yeah, yeah. I hope essential means that from the beginning of being given a command, you've understood what the ultimate purpose is, because that's the one thing you have to get. You can give up a lot of things along the way, but your flexibility can't give that part, right? So um, the thing I want to add to what was just said before, I think Quan was talking, is um, just the way your advantage has to be looked at critically so that you see what disadvantages might be contained in it, because it could be a feint, it could be something which advances part of your goals, but traps others in a way that you, you can't, you have to see the disadvantage. The other way it goes too, it says here, it reflects that and says, look at your disadvantage, look at your desperation, look at where you're in a bad position, if you're open to all the possibilities there, you can find a way out. So even with your intelligence, you may not have all the intelligence until you're in the situation, but you have to keep flexible so that you're open to that open door. That's all. Yeah, I appreciate the um, clarification and I agree with you, the idea of the essential part of a, a scheme uh needing your value your purpose your objective whatever however you wish to frame it uh be clear uh because then you actually you know have a a, a goal so to speak well you uh, because joe this is weighing the advantages and disadvantages at every step you're looking for an advantage but there may be a disadvantage on the way but that overall one that's the essence right Exactly, exactly. And I think the other part about it that's uh, this kind of is in line with the rest of the text that we've been reading in the sense that you're seeing your weaknesses and your strengths, right? Know your weaknesses and know your strengths. So that, you know, within that, you be able, you will be able to identify advantages and disadvantages, but not to overestimate your strengths in that process as well, is to be, be mindful of that. Um, so, James. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I like the number two, uh, verse two. The um, the first one, it looks a little bit, a little bit like a kind of like a uh, an interesting syllogism. There's a, there's a, there's like a couple of it's like a blend blend these advantages and disadvantages, and then there's a tautology about advantages and a tautology about disadvantages. So I understand the difficulty in translating there. Uh, the second one though. Uh, this this idea of reducing or suppressing or surfing the feudal lords that's perfect i mean that's you you have to own them if you come upon these feudal lords inflict damage uh make trouble uh and and on the other hand you can entice them by uh providing advantages to them right that don't hurt your army you know that that aren't a problem for your for your project so uh so so in other words own them to be to be the to be the uh to be the uh master uh and uh, cuz they were only feudal lords they have small armies so uh i think it's a beautiful beautiful line thank you yeah i think it also goes to to other points that we've been discussing throughout the text as well as to be precise and to actually know who to uh who needs to be for lack of a better term suppressed uh or compromised and so i think that that leads into the idea of having intelligence uh as well so i mean you know this is there's a lot of different parts of this that you can see kind of coming together uh this is more just the tactical aspect of what we're talking about uh you know we've been talking about it more strategically up until this point I mean, well that's not completely true a couple chapters we've been talking about tactics but um nonetheless uh 
I think that that's that's a uh, a very important thing to consider is the precision aspect um, and to know to know who to hit. Um, Michael. Yeah, I think um, it's important in in competition that you pay very close attention to your opponent's mindset uh, when they are at disadvantage because the the tactics and mindset of the desperate are very very different than the person that's in the lead. And that's how games get away or a chess game, for example, can get away from somebody with a great advantage is you just keep pressing your advantage, but you forget it's it's zero sum. So the loser is now becoming more and more desperate. They have no choice but to change their tactic. And if you forget that, you're no longer at an even footing and you keep playing against them as if they're gonna react normally. That's a, that's a grave, grave danger happens in a lot of sports. You have to just keep keep uh, your opponent's mindset uh, always, always at hand. Very good point. Um, yeah, that's an excellent point. Uh, it reminds me of uh, a scene, uh, for those of you who have ever seen the uh, Second Godfather movie, uh, where a rebel blows himself up. And, and Michael says, oh, well, you know, it tells me something. And he says, it tells me that they can win. And because the rebel actually blew himself up, he was willing to die for the cause. And so that he was, that they were even more dangerous than the first estimated by, uh, by the government at that particular moment in time. Um, the general is escaping me who was uh, in charge prior to Castro. Um, but uh, I want to say Batista, something, I forget. Anyway, anyway, uh, uh, Anne, please. Yeah, um, I have, um, you know, he, he enumerates in the translation that was read the uh, idea of suppressing the enemy and then, uh, you know, and I can't remember the first two, but he, he chooses to leave as the third option um, something that's a little more... Um, soft, a softer strategy, tempt, uh, tempt them with gain, you know? Uh, and the claim is that this possible, or I at least heard the suggestion that this was like a negotiation thing or a, you know, this is in the context of, of uh, negotiating with um, elites. But anyway, I'm just curious about the, why he puts that as the uh, in the text as the third option and not instead the primary or first option. Um, it, it seems to me there's some tension in the text as well. I, I have a different translation. So mine is, uh, I'm having a hard time marrying the two, but there's some tension in the text uh, wherein, for example, I recall an earlier um, uh, more, um, I guess, emphatic statement that one ought not to, uh, when one is in a good position, um, uh, inflict as much damage as possible on the enemy. Um, and, um, you know, anyway, I'm wondering if anybody has any comments about that or do they sense the same, uh, yeah. have the same curiosity as I do about how those relate. Thank you, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, and uh, let, let me respond to this one, not by a different translation, by what I read in Chinese this way. Okay. Uh, I see these three, they lay out from the most harsh to soft, okay? And I don't see the, in, the, the means, the importance of these three. I, the, the way I read it is these three are equal important. All right. that, that's, that's the way I read it. And what's the reason? Uh, I've been thinking about this for a long, long, long time. Okay, But I, I will talk about it at the end of today's section. But I see the format of the three verses are identical. All right, And they, as soon as they didn't put the one, two, three. And the format, if you read it in Chinese, you will, let me show if I let me show for a second, you will see the format are identical. 
okay? The, the, this is three of the vice. The format are identical. I didn't put the number on that. That's e high, e ye, e di, right? They're all identical. The first three words, qi zu hou, yi zu hou, they, they only change the first word and the, the last word, the, the rest are the same. Only change the first word and the last word in Chinese. Okay. So that's how they lay out this one. And I don't see uh, the perfect per pattern, okay, just like a formula. Okay, X and the Y, and X1 is Y1, and X2, Y2, X3, Y3. Okay, that, that's it. Okay, so if for this reason, I believe uh, it's equally important. You know. I wanted to add something real quick, which I think may help Anne. Um, when Sun Tzu was talking about always leave an enemy a route for retreat, he's talking about an enemy in battle. These are suggestions for dealing with feudal lords, and he makes that distinction clear. And you have to treat the two very differently, otherwise you may invite another battle that you don't intend to have. A very good comment. Um, Thank you. Uh, and do you have any, okay. Um, so- Yeah, I, I do have, um, and I, I um, is that also, Jason, I heard you pronounce some of the phrases. Are they poetic as well? Do they rhyme? Uh, no, they don't rhyme. Okay, I don't see, in... I don't see Sun Tzu write this one as a poetry. Okay, I think, but I, I, I will talk about it later because I've been chasing it because that's the way to convince people. They, 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 the the Chinese, ancient Chinese writer take the advantage of monotone of the Chinese. Okay, boom, 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 boom. So they, they, they set up in the same tempo, okay? And then kind of like push to your mind, nail to your mind. And <laughs> then you're like, okay, I got it. But <laughs> with- Well, I, I did hear, boom, I did hear right, in the middle and, phrases, I heard this, I heard uh, similar sounds in those phrases in the middle, in the not at the ends, but in the middle, what you were reading. Because they are the same words. They are the exactly oh, the same. You. Only the first word and the last words are different. Okay. Just oh, okay. like the formula. Okay. You put the X1, it become Y1, X2 become Y2. That's it. Nothing changed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and okay, we'll move on to Mark. Thanks, Joseph. I was just wondering about the concept of the blending together of the advantage and the disadvantage. And I think Jason, you may have used the word mixing because I was wondering how intimately linked together are these things? You know, in a, if we're thinking in a sort of Hegelian way, we know that things contain their opposite or become their opposites in some ways the essences are related. So when David S was speaking and, and David, you said the advantage in the disadvantage, that kind of reinforced, are these things so intimately linked or is one thing an advantage and another thing is a disadvantage? It's not like there's a disadvantage in the advantage in a Hegelian sense. That's what I'm wondering how people are reading this. I'll yeah. let David answer for himself, but I, I think I have an idea yeah. what he's going to say. Uh, yeah, let me respond to this one. I, of course, um, we know Sun Tzu never read Hegel, okay? And, the, and I believe, the reason I believe it's not a Hegelian sense, because it's not synthetic, because the words he used is very strange, okay? It's za, okay? The word za means mess up or mix, okay? He doesn't use other more Hegelian sense words like cha means uh, 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 make it clear, okay? Uh, investigate. He didn't use this kind of pa pa possible Hegelian words. He used very non-Hegelian words, which is za means mm, mess up, mix together. Okay, that's the Chinese word. That's why I will say no, it's not a Gideon sense of advantage and disadvantage. That's my response. Yeah. Do you want to respond really quickly, Mark? 
Yeah, I guess the reason I was thinking it possibly could be was if you are holding a position that might be an advantage, but if you do it too long, it might become a disadvantage. You know, does the same thing turn into its opposite or do you have an advantage and then as a result of something else, extraneous or external, a disadvantage may show up? I, I, I have no, I think that's uh, yeah, up to you to interpret, but I, I just look at the, the I, my answer is basically look at the text without further thinking. I just look at the text and that's the, what the Sun Tzu is talking about. And you can have any kind of interpretation, but uh, that's the word. I, I like to focus the word. Because the word za, okay, means mess up, mix up, uh, blend it. It really bothered me in this case because it's very unusual in the uh, text, uh, philosophical teaching text come with this word. I just have a second question. When you put in the, Parenthetical expressions, expecting disadvantages and seizing dis and seizing advantages. Were you just adding that, or is that in the Chinese the original? Okay, so, uh, uh, yeah, I should be more precise on that, but because uh, my uh, when I do the translation, I also learn it, right? So, okay, so there's a two possibilities. In this case, I put the princess is I. The, usually it means the text is not there, but I put there, okay, to make it clear. So, because like I said, a lot of Chinese, most of the ancient Chinese, there's no subject. So if I don't put the subject, it sounds very strange, okay? So I have to put the subject on that to make it clear, to make it gram grammatically correct, okay? so. Uh, or sometimes make it the meaning complete. That's why I put a printed. Another time I put a printed, sometimes it's all or optional words. Okay, I should separate it. I, I was thinking about put a, a bracket for the optional word. Okay, and the printed yeah. is the words I put in. I probably will, will start to do in this. And then sometimes I put the blue text. That means that's amongst suggestion and I decide not take it. So I put a, 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 a blue card over there. That, that's the, the, the convention I've been using. Okay. So I just wanted to say in the, in the, in the rest of the English, you made it completely clear. The wise man is the subject of the second and third sentences and uh, nothing else. It's completely clear. Uh, it, it just makes it confusing, I think, when you add the parenthetical expressions. Okay. Because we already know we're mixing. We're mixing okay. these two. We'll okay, on. yeah, yeah. Probably, probably because I, I want to make it clear, but you in your opinion, it confuses you, right? Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm going to put in a word for uh translational uh consistency. Parentheticals in a translation inevitably mean the a translator's addition. That's pretty universally standard. So it's not as if it was invented for this. Um, and it's been done since we started with the Tao Te Ching. Anytime <laughs> there was a parenthetical, it's because it's an explainer, it's a clarifier, it's adding a subject that is omitted otherwise. Thank you. Uh, so well, well, really, really, I, I really thank you. Uh, 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 we went out of order for that and became a me. I hope we remember what the original question I was going to address with Ian said. It's with the sorry, um, what Mark said about the Hegelian question. I thought it was an interesting question. Where our translation that we're given was given advantage and disadvantage, which puts them in total opposition. So these are opposites. Now, whether that is a valid translation, that's up for you to tell us. But both of them do have something they have to share in common, their motives in war, the things that make you move because you're going to use that or move away from because you got to get away from it. These are things that are relevant to the success, the, the energy flow in the war. So these are necessarily in a dialect of the dialogue with each other. For us to read this 
text, however, I agree with Jason, as a dialectic analysis of the concepts of advantage and disadvantage is a philosophical overlay that I don't think is here. Right. Yeah, okay, thanks. I think that that's a fair assessment. Um, Kwan. Uh, <clears throat> I think that in this paragraph, you have two very basic Chinese ideas. Uh, I want to, to begin with the end. Uh, the last two or three lines is about uh, the basic ideas of legalism, okay? The, the principles and practices of statecraft and administration to give a longer translation or the art of the ruler. So you have to give rewards or punishment. So it's a very basic Chinese idea. The other very ch basic Chinese ideas is uh, the yin yang thinking, okay? Uh, if you're in the situation where you think you are winning, uh, there is a possibility of losing if you too obsess in your mind with your idea of winning. And if you, but if in the situation where you think you are losing, and uh, I, I insist on you think, okay, because always it's about the mind. Well, there is a possibility of winning if you are open minded enough. Thank you, Juan. Um, next, we'll go to Madeline. Then we'll go uh, to yes. Well, um, my general impression from this discussion, uh, whether this is Hegelian or what it is, I think I was thinking it sounds more like the general is functioning as a pivot. In other words, he's the pivot between advantages and disadvantages. And so in that sense, he's like a mixing, he's like a mixing center where he's turning, he's turning these two things around. Um, and so I think the use of the word sa, as Jason described it, it made me think of the Dan Tien, uh, which is one of the places in the body where the, the different chi energies mix. And so in that sense, this, um, this sense of things being mixed together in a messy way uh, could be related to that sense of the lower belly um, where the general is acting on the battlefield, dealing with all these messy forces that are kind of thrown together and blending them and then pivoting and turning things around. Excellent comments, thank you, uh, Jason. Yeah, uh, two points I'd like to make. First, uh, um, I really appreciate James uh, tell me that oh, oh, everyone is, is a confusion. And, uh, they, I have not heard before. Okay, or oh, so oh, this one make it not clear. Uh, and that's very important to me because uh, since we do the translation and uh, then I do that and uh, really uh, honest response, I think that's very important. So I will know. Uh, what other people's mind and then uh, uh, second thing uh, is Quan talk about the yin yang on the first and I think that really makes sense you know I forget uh, and in this sense uh, uh, za is correct and then I also see some uh, 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 a paper they link yin yang with Hegelian okay so in this sense it's a Hegelian sense that that's also connected. So uh, I think the yin yang probably the right uh, interpretation. Okay, since he is a Chinese, not a <laughs> Hegelian, so uh, yin yang probably make more sense. Thank you, Jason. Uh, we will go on to number three, and the only thing I would re uh, recommend probably we want to oh. finish it. You know, hey, would you have a very good comment. Uh, Okay. Uh, Jason, just, could I just ask Jason before we move on, because you mentioned the relationship between yin yang and something which is Hegelian. In, in yin yang, you have the yin in yang and you have the yang in yin, but they're not opposites, right? So- I, I will say yin yang is the opposite. I, I think that one thing that's very important to keep in uh, keep under consideration here is we're talking about tactics. 
And that, that's different than talking about philosophical strategic approaches or, or principles. So there, when we're in the beginning, we're talking about principles. Now we're talking about how you're actually executing those tactics. And so that's slightly different when you start comparing yin yang or Hegel or anything like that. So anyway, I, that's my opinion. Um, so let's move on from there. Uh, with a, uh, or David, do you have one comment? Uh, I'm volunteering to read number three. Okay. Oh, Okay. But that, that's finished with number three and number four. Because number three yeah, let's do three awesome. and four together. All right, wind it up short. We can um, talk about Hegelia if we want. <laughs> starting with three, the art of war teaches us to rely not on the likelihood of the enemy's not coming, but on our own readiness to receive him, not on the chance of his not attacking, but rather on the fact that we have made our position unassailable. There are five dangerous faults which may affect a general. One, recklessness, which leads to destruction. Two, cowardice, which leads to capture. Three, a hasty temper, which can be provoked by insults. Four, a delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame. Five, over solicitude for his men, which exposes him to worry and trouble. These are the five besetting sins of a general, ruinous to the conduct of war. When an army is overthrown and its leader slain, the cause will surely be found among these five dangerous faults. Let them be a subject of meditation. Thank you, Dave. Would anybody else like to read? Uh, thank you. I'm on. Certainly. Since I'm reading to the end, it's not hard to find my place. <laughs> it is a doctrine of war not to assume the enemy will not come, but rather to rely on one's readiness to meet him. Not to presume that he will not attack, but rather to make oneself invincible. There are five qualities which are dangerous in the character of a general. If reckless, he can be killed. If cowardly, captured. If quick-tempered, you can make a fool of him. If he has too delicate a sense of honor, you can calum calumate him. <clears throat> Excuse me. If he, if he is of a compassionate nature, you can harass him. Now, these five traits of character are serious faults in yeah. general and in military operations are calamitous. The ruin of the army and the death of the general are inevitably results of these shortcomings. They must be deeply pondered. Thank you, Amon. Uh, so, Jason, we'll go to your translation now. Okay, so um, this one. Okay, so um, number three. Number three, I think it's most of the translation uh, almost the same because we all copy each other. Guys make the perfect translation, I have to say. Okay, so thus, the method of military operation is to rely on, is to rely not on the likelihood that they are not coming, but on our readiness to receive them. That's right, okay not on the chances, uh, not on the chance that they won't attack us, but on our situation of being unattackable. This one become a common saying in Chinese uh, words, okay? 无事起不来, 事无有以待之, that's been a very common saying. And uh, then Gaio made a very good translation, uh, is mm, rely not on the likelihood that that they are not coming, but on our readiness, on our readiness, uh, just one minute, right, on our readiness to receive them. I think that make a very good, uh, uh, very good translation. And then, um, uh, so I, I have not much to explain on this one. Okay, and the next one, thus a general may commit five dangerous faults. Okay, 
determination to die. Okay, uh, just for uh, James, I, here I put the parentheses, I should put bracket on that. Okay, that means that's optional words. And I try to translate as word to word and in the Chinese called 必死, okay, must die. So I translate it as determination to die. Okay, that means, you know, you are ready to sacrifice, okay. So determin determination to die, which leads to destruction. Determination to live, which leads to capture. A hasty temper, which leads to being insulted. Cherishing honor, which leads to being shamed. Love for all people, which leads to trouble. These five faults are the general's mistake. They cause disasters in military operations. When an army is overthrown and the general is killed, the causes must be among these five dangerous foot. It is a subject that must be examined. Uh, I think these words are very important. Book Ye is appear on the very first paragraph of the first chapter. It appear here, and you will see the same word uh, 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 show in the for the entire text. That means that's the subject you must study. Bu cannot 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 not to do this. That means must. So you must know this subject. Okay, you will see this sentence again and again. Okay, so uh, something I like to mention here is. Here, you start to go to uh, against the common moral sense, right? For example, love people, okay? So it, it causes the problem, right? In the general, if you love all people, okay? You, you know, you send the military, some people, some soldiers are going to die any war, okay? But if you want to love everyone, you want to save everybody? They, that, that's the problem, right? Lianjie, that means clean and incorrupt, uh, incorruptible, okay? So that's also a good virtue. But this one also causes problem, right? Because you, here is represented, I translate as honor, because in uh, Chinese tradition, these two words means your honor. So the, Sometimes you cannot achieve your goal because you are too clean. You are worried about your reputation too much. You cannot do it. So I think the Sun Tzu's text here is very practical here, right? He talked about you ready to sacrifice yourself. That's also the problem. You think about how to survive. That's also the problem, right? If you get angry easily, indignation, that's also a problem. Okay, you are too clean, you are thinking about your reputation, that's the problem. You have too much love. Okay, that's also the problem. Okay, so he put the general in a very practical way. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Amal. Yeah. Oh, okay. I will normally reserve my comments towards the end, but because we're getting late, I want to give as much time as possible. But as much as I desperately want to, I have to address the Hegel thing. Um, and I have to do it because Hegel and Schopenhauer were both in Prussia, professors at a university, and some of the earliest consumers of Eastern thought in the Western world, which lo and behold, I can't tell you how gobsmacked I was the first time to read Schopenhauer and realize, oh, you just plagiarized Buddhism wholesale and misunderstood it. And there's not much difference in Hegel. As genius as he has claimed to be, there's a whole lot of pilfering from his dalliances with Eastern texts, particularly the I Ching and um, concepts like yin and yang, where we get dialectics from. But their plagiarism aside, because I would never accuse Buddha of sounding too much like Schopenhauer. It would just feel insincere. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about um, just briefly 
some, some of the overriding ideas of what is correct action. And I want to quote from um, King Fu Chai, who actually it's quoting, oh, what is his name? Sorry, I should have, have had this on hand, but I believe it's Chu, oh, Chi Lin. Qi Lin, who, or Cheng Yu, who is quoting King Fu Chai, who is reported to have said, when you see the correct course, act. Don't wait on orders. That was his directive in war. And the Kingdom of Wu was very successful in the early Warring States period. But this sums up what we were getting at before about the idea between deferring to authority versus taking action into your own hand. And when the king gives this directive to his general, his general is then empowered to be able to say, okay, I don't have to sit around twiddling my thumbs waiting for the order. This is the correct course of action. Conversely, know that you are taking the correct course of action. If you're hemming and hawing, if you're on the fence, if you are plagued by any of those five foibles of a general being overly covetous towards your life, overly covetous to a glorious death, overly covetous to honor, overly covetous to people, you are not going to be able to make an objective decision. And that's what each of those faults that he's talking about really stand for is wanting something too much, wanting something more than the objective that you were sent out to do, which is to win a military affair or a military campaign which needs to be your overriding mission, your overriding vision in action. Um, a general might be lucky once on the battlefield, but a good general will continue to have those sort of results, which is the difference between accuracy in performance and precision in performance. Precision is accuracy repeated over time. Uh, Last but not least, we touched oh so briefly on the importance of spies. It's coming up. It's at the end of this. But it ties into this idea of the supremacy of good information. And there's a quote from Bill Gates that's a contemporary version that kind of captures Sun Tzu's sentiment on this. Gathering, controlling, man and managing information is the root to success in any endeavor against any opponent. That was his quote talking about Microsoft way back when against Apple. And even though Apple has been more than gloriously successful, you can't deny Microsoft is still up and running strong. And both of us are of them are giving us pretty remarkable chat GPS or GPTs. Is it GPT or GPS? Chat GPT. Yeah. yeah, sorry. I should know this. I'm seeing enough papers from students written by them. Um, and I want to thank everybody. It's absolutely wonderful to get a spirited conversation. I'm astonished we actually made it through all four chapters. Um, I'm excited to hear your comments. And if I drop off, it's because my time's run out. But I'll look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you so much, Amara. So next up is David. There you are, sorry, toggling around. Um, so I'm trying to clear this up in my mind, sort of separate these issues because we've come up to this point recognizing the importance of intelligence and the correct use of information so that you can judge how to fool your enemy and how they're fooling you. And so the, the question of proper information and getting incorrect information and recognizance, not counting how many of their troops have been moved somewhere, or if they have better intel on you than you can tell about. Where is miscalculation and all of this, this thinking yourself too powerful or not knowing you're, you know, how it's really laid out. How is that thrown into these five questions, which are seeming to ignore all that and talk about 
sort of um, personality flaws, which is, you know, if you're rushing in recklessly, this is this one translation, Jason's translation said you're determined to die. Does that mean externally looking at you, I can see it's determined you're going to die? Or does you have a determination to go into battle and and be, you know, destroyed? That doesn't make sense. So the recklessness may have to do with your lack of information. So these five things don't talk about the information, which could be the general's weakness. Yeah, no. so the, these are the character flaws, right? Or are we saying after the fact, you lost, so you're rushing in at that point, which you thought was all the great is actually was just reckless. You know, it, it, this is supposed to help you predictively. It's no good if it's a retrospective of what happened, right? That's true. Uh, that, um, so, sorry, I probably have to leave at the, uh, right at, at eight o'clock or in, in five minutes. Uh, so let me respond to David quickly on this one. Uh, I, I would like to know, please let me know. And um, I changed the, I've been thinking about the Chinese word, beast. Okay, the two words, must die. Okay, this word. Okay, so it's hard to translate. If I translate as word by word, that means must die. Okay, that sounds very strange. That's why I translate to determination to die. That means you are ready to die. Okay, you. If you see, that's also in Japan, right? Sometimes they put the, 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 the white band here and write the two words, and that's must die, okay? That's what they do it, okay? Uh, you can search from the uh, Google, you see the picture, okay? That's must yeah, die. Who, who, who must die, the enemy or you? What do you, you, you want? You, me, oh, me. I must die. Like I'm willing to die. All you will say, willing to die, okay? So, I mean, anytime. I need my life, take it, okay? That, that's the purpose. That's the word meaning, okay? So uh, please help me uh, uh, make it the words. I think the reckless is a good uh, 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 translation, but it doesn't reflect the word, okay? So I hope you got the word. And I, I still struggling what would be the best way to translate this word, okay? Must die. It means I don't mind. Whenever necessary, I, I I I sacrifice my life. That's what I mean. Okay, that means you, my enemy must die. That means me. Okay? So that's the thing. And the second thing about the miscalculation. Uh, he didn't talk about this. Okay, I don't see any place in the later chapter he talk about miscalculation. Okay. Uh, but I know Sun Tzu is very focused on calculation. You need to calculate. Then let me defend for Sun Tzu's uh, uh, text. I think the reason is most of people probably don't calculate because you deal with very incomplete information. Uh -huh. So his suggestion is calculate. The more calculation, you have more chance to win. That's the only thing he want to say. Okay, and he doesn't say if I'm, how about if you miscalculate? I, I don't think he talked about this and why? I, I think calculation probably a new concept for him. So like in the uh, emerge of information era, you don't talk about misinformation. Oh, this guy is just to say more information is bad. I think that's- I was, I was hoping you were going to give the opposite answer and say that since he said up front that information is key, we he guarantee- didn't we're, we're pulling all stops out to get information. So the only things left that can fail are you're too anxious to go in when you know the situation is perilous. You're not following my rules. You're reckless. Or you, know, this, uh, you see, that given the information, these five things made sense. But if you're not, you, at the end, to sum it up and say, those are the five reasons you lose and check out the general, that didn't feel right. If he didn't have the right information, he may not have been reckless at all. He was just misled, you know? Yeah, I think that, that that's fine. That's your opinion. But I, I, as I state many, many times, my job, read the text, reflect the text. Okay. Uh, I don't want to uh, try not to impose too much on that. But I'd like to point out before I leave, uh, it's very important from the later chapter. 
And that's uh, consist with my view of he is speaking to the general because you will see the tone start to put more and more burden on the general. That's your fault. That must be fault. Okay, tell fault. That will be, and the next few chapter you will see Sun Tzu's tone become severe. He talk about when you fail, that's the problem. It must be this problem. That's your responsibility. So I think he his purpose is put the burden on the general. Okay. I, I think that's, Thanks, that makes sense. If I can interrupt, please, yeah, please. Uh, like Jason, I'm going to have to go, but I think David's question was an important one and it allows me to readdress something that was discussed before going back to this, who's the audience? And I don't think this it's an either or option. As I stated uh, when we started, I think it's very possible that both the prince and the general are the target audience of this text. The idea being presented to the prince so that he understands both the expectations and that he is not qualified to actually make these calculations. And the prince, in turn, pass it on to his general to do this sort of calculating because the whole text is a protracted argument against the miscalculation of engaging in war. Mm -hmm. When to do it, why to do it, what are the real reasons that somebody should undertake this and what are the real costs when you talk about the value of information in the last chapter we'll get to spies and the price tag he presents for how much you should pay spies is enough to make any bao wong any false king sit up in their throne and say what that's an entire platoon and his argument to this point is yeah it is and it's worth it and it's critical that you do this because the type of warfare that you have been wedded to, the charioteer ceremonial warfare between um, the warlords or princes is antiquated. It's outdated when we're fielding these huge conscripted armies. Bravado and honor and going out, you know, being the biggest man on the field is no longer enough. If you picture two charioteers riding at each other, the one who looks fiercer, it's like driving, playing chicken in cars. You can spook the other person off the field and then look, you just won the war. You, rah, 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 look at me. That might work under those circumstances. With a fielded army of tens of thousands, the looks or the appearance, the facade of it, the shirt of it doesn't really matter as much as you know, the shoe of it. Is it substantial or is it just fake and hollow? So I think all of those kind of tie together. Who are we talking to? Everyone involved in warfare from the top down. Who are we giving this advice to? Both the person who can give the orders and the person entrusted with the orders and that you are an entr entrusting and how you should make that evaluation not because they were the big man on the field, but because they've shown careful deliberation and understanding. Um, that's it. I got to run. I'll listen on for a bit, but thanks. And I'll see you all next week. Thank you, Amon. Uh, next up, we have Anne. Yeah, I just want to... Um... You know, he talks about these five traits, and um, it seems to me that the they involve, um, in the con on the contrary, uh, to say being willing to easily give your life to really uh, prizing your life that would contrast with the recklessness and uh, concept, correct? And then um, you know the or. Well, I, I'm tired. I'm sorry, folks. I'm, I'm very tired. But uh, um, so at some level, I really like this focus area because of its, again, uh, some of the psychology that's um, implicit, you know, the nice psychology. And mm -hmm. then also, it helps me to read the book instead of as a 
um, uh, like instead of uh, being literal with Sun Tzu's uh, talk of wars and battles and armies, I can kind of uh, place it in a more friendly, uh, to me anyway, uh, role as sort of a text exploring um, uh, some of the, um, if you will, individual battles that I face in my own life. You know what I'm saying? Like how to navigate some rough uh, terrain uh, personally. Um, and that's it, I think. Oh, is that okay? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that when you talk about personal strategies, that it can be uh, applied to that. Um, in fact, I was thinking about uh, something that uh, there's an exercise with the Stoics called premeditatia, malorum, premeditation on adversity. And I thought about that a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the passages uh, when it spoke about. Uh, uh preparing yourself for the worst case scenario um so yeah there's a lot of personal uh things that this uh that this text can apply to so thank you yeah i'm i'm started thank you i i, I do have another thought uh quickly uh you know when we talk about him get going to this these so-called calculations and all of the um rough estimates is what i would call him of, you know i don't imagine he was looking over uh <laughs> the government budgets in some sort of accounting role in terms of, you know, ordering and procuring supplies and what have you. I don't know, but uh, it doesn't make sense that he would uh, know these things, but he would sort of have a rough feel and he would kind of boost, maybe boost the numbers to dissuade uh, anyone from going to war. Cause it seems to me more as I read it, it's, it's more of a manual of let's avoid war. <laughs> At, at, at most costs, you know, let's try not to do it. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely. And that's highlighted in the previous chapters where, uh, you know, he's warning uh, the princes of the economic harms, the devastation that will happen at home if you do decide to go to war, uh, what will happen to your rice fields, what will happen to, you know, your food supplies and, and, and the cost uh, is not just to the enemy. Uh, it's actually to yourself as well, even if you are victorious, so that nobody does win a war. Uh, and I do think that that is a, a theme throughout uh, throughout the text. Uh, so I think it's very much uh, appropriate. Um, so, Quan, you're next. Okay. So I would like to. Uh, say that the last paragraph is like a negative mirror of the Mencius, okay? Because uh, I like very much to put in parallel the Mencius, which is a philosophical book and a strategic book too, with the Sun Tzu, because uh, the Sun Tzu would express negatively or by mentioning the, the moral or character defects when the Mencius would mention the uh, the, the cardinal virtues, because once again, the four cardinal virtues are justice, valor, humanity, and wisdom. And if you look at uh, the five stuff that are mentioned, the recklessness, or maybe a very fun translation would be kamikaze, uh, to, to follow what uh, Jason said for Pisu, that uh, someone, if someone is determined to die, well, he wouldn't lose for sure. Uh, he wouldn't at least lose his life. So recklessness is uh, the negative version of valor, of true valor. And um, cowardice is also a negative version of valor. Uh, a hasty temper would be, would be a manifestation of lack of wisdom. Uh, delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame, would be the negative image of uh, justice. And uh, over solicitude for his man, which is too much uh, care would be a negative manifestation of humanity precisely. So I would say that when Mencius would uh, offer his perspective on in much more broader general principles with the cardinal virtues, you have in the Sun Tzu the mention of the very practical character defects expressing the lack of those uh, 
cardinal virtues precisely. I very much appreciate you linking the tactics directly uh, to the virtues, um, primarily because the virtues are interrelated and as are these tactics actually. Um, and so that you can see where, you know, I'm reading this translation, uh, recklessness leads to destruction and how cowardness leads to uh, to capture. Uh, those two aren't necessarily um, uh, mutually exclusive in a way, in the sense that you're both ending up in a uh, in a less than uh, ideal position. Um, and then the which one did you say? The only one I had a question on is the justice one with it honor. Yes, honor because. Uh... Uh, honor is well. Honor is the la nice word for the aristocratic pride. Okay, so right, uh, right. so that well, if we we take into account the the time where Sun Tzu wrote, but even nowadays, honor is a kind of uh, nice word <laughs> for the ego. So uh, so uh, honor, in a certain sense, is the idea that one is superior to the others. Uh, even it's if. It can be justified sometime, even if that person has uh, more achievements. It can be debated, of course. But justice would be the capacity to see, among other things, because justice is a very broad concept. But uh, in this uh, link to, with that expression, that a delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame, justice is precisely the capacity to see everyone as fundamentally equal. Very nice. I would not have saw, seen that unless uh, you brought that up. Very good. We actually had done a whole meetup on honor a few years ago. Uh, I'll actually look for that and put it in the chat. Um, James, I would like to come back to some of these themes though. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna congratulate Chuan for using the word negative. Because uh, these, uh, these uh, virtues... James, uh, the, uh, my Q is an uh, English alphabet Q, not a pinyin Q. I'm sorry, I misunderstand you. I uh, it's mean it's Quan and it's not Chuan because Quan, if Quan. Uh, yeah, don't, yeah, don't because, be, okay. uh, no, I, I understand why you say that, but many people think that my name is written yeah. with the pinging and it's not written with the pinging. I apologize. No okay, problem. so uh, yeah. Uh, remember the, the, one of the earlier meetings on uh, Confucius, there was uh, a, a lot of hemming and hawing about what you would accept as the pronunciation. So I'm glad it was straightened out. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this, uh, the, the, the virtues are both negative as well as positive. So uh, there, there, are, there are positive forms in which they can be misled or uh, I mean, negative w ways in which they could be misled, or they simply human nature is such as there's this uh, very wide uh, distribution of virtue across the population, across populations. And I, I, I've been to a lot of poker games. I've been to a lot of uh, public forums. I mean, I see this all the time. Uh, this, is, this is what he's talking about here, are fatal, what he considers to be fatal psychological weaknesses that would be inappropriate for a leader, but they're also like inappropriate for a, uh, like a game player. So somebody that plays chess uh, can't, uh, can't uh, will, will, will be in trouble if he sacrifices a pawn just on a hunch, uh, you know, he's in a tournament, you know, and he wants to win a thousand bucks, but he, he sacrifices a punch because he's won a couple games sacrificing pawns. No, it has to be actually a calculation he has to be Bobby Fisherish, you know. He's got to he's got to make a calculation that he's going to win the game if he sacrifices that pawn or that queen or whatever he's doing. Um, and and and, uh, and and I see this constantly uh, in 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 poker. Unless you're like a top player, the top players always use game theory and uh, Bayes' theorem, uh, game, game theory to make the calculations. And if there's a possibility of deception, use Bayes' theorem to uh, average in the cost to you, the money cost of uh, whether 
the the uh, a, de a, a deception can actually be affecting uh, your your average outcome, uh, not just the average outcome, but it could be the actual amount of money that you have at stake. You know whether you're going to win ten thousand dollars in the tournament or you're going to win zero in the tournament. Things like that, calculations like that. So uh, and this the, these other ones are just like right along the same idea. Cowardice. Uh, in other words, I'll always give up if I'm in doubt. No. You always have to make a calculation. Uh, hasty, temp hasty temper, uh, the uh, uh, being sensitive, being oversensitive. Uh, I see, you know, you see it all the time. Uh, and over solicitude, like you care about others too much. You just, uh, and in this case, over solicitude for his men. His men have to fight the battle. You have to be able to commit troops or you're not a general, or you're not a commander. So uh, it's a it's it's a it's a brilliant ending, and um, I just uh, the uh, the yeah. The, so I I I I did want to bring in the other one, uh, the situation of being unattackable. Uh, yeah, so that's really important. In eight point three, he says uh, there's a chance they won't attack us, but what really matters is whether or not you're in a situation, you have the situation of being unattackable. If you have the situation of being unattackable, it really doesn't matter that much, the question of whether they're going to attack or not, because you know who's going to prevail. So that's another, you know, so that's 8.3. Eight, eight, it's a separate consideration from the, the fatal psychological weaknesses in 8.4, but they're both important points to make for, for Sun Tzu to make here. Yeah, and I actually very much I appreciate the game theory analogy, uh, especially when it comes to poker. Uh, interestingly enough, like in poker, you'll give away some hands as well, uh, and in order to over the long term, kind of uh, to win. Uh, so the the idea that you're always going to do or follow a rule, a certain rule, sometimes doesn't necessarily make sense. So, in, in other words, if you're cowardice and you're just going to fold every single time that you feel like you're not going to win that would not necessarily be an effective strategy because the idea is to kind of it's a long you know to build up uh, a situation where uh, you can use deception but if you always are folding and you know people will pick up on that right away um and as well as uh individuals that could be provoked um, and I've actually seen that uh, in at a poker table where people will will um, overplay their hands um, because of their their tempers actually get the best of them. Uh, so it really does. Uh, it is a game theory type of approach because it's it's extremely probabilistic, as is this entire text. In a way, I feel like Sun Tzu the whole time is probabilistic and how uh, how to attack even um, uh, the size of the forces to attack, uh, you know, the the um, understanding the weaknesses and the strengths, understanding the terrain, all of that comes into the ideas of, you know, you're figuring in, there, there are a lot of variables uh, and this is mostly I'm being I'm guessing on intuition. But uh, at this particular moment in time, but uh, it's uh, this is why it's still applicable in today's modern day. Uh, so I think that that's a fantastic analogy because it's important to to link this text to modern days because I, I think it's it's extremely relevant um, to to uh, everyday life in one way or another. Um, so I, anyway, that's the reason I enjoy this text. Um, so, uh, we'll go to Anne. Thank you, James. Yes, I may have in listening to all the earlier comments kind of lost my train of thought, but it does uh, occur to me, um, <laughs> to critique, uh, some of the sense of, uh, 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 Sun Tzu's The Art of War, in particular, he talks about it, that it's a, a fault to have too much fellow feeling, 
uh, for your troops. And uh, I would have, I would suggest that uh, I do not see that as a fault <laughs> in leadership. Um, you know, if people have fellow feeling for one another, that actually would be um, the most exemplary form of leadership that one could ever exercise on planet Earth. Um, and it should be extolled as a serious and heavy, if not most valuable virtue. Um, I, um, I had some other, oh, uh, it was something you said, Juan, um, the honor concept with the shame. Um, you know, you talked about it as an antiquated, um, you know, um, uh, concept for elites. Uh, I, I read it in a more modern sense, honor. Honor to me is where we try to marry the words that we speak, that we utter to the deeds that we actually perform. So to me, um, the shame component is not a false component that, in, that ensues when the, the word that you tell someone doesn't match how you perform in real life. You suffer with great shame as well you should because you've made a, a, some sort of indication that you were going to perform some action for someone else. And then in fact, you did not. So there's, the, I think it's shame in that sense is actually the psychological equivalent of holding yourself to account. You know, not, all, and I'm, I'm not talking about it being unforgivable. For example, if you make an error or you forget or something like that. But uh, again, another um, area that I, I actually uh, think honor in my uh, view, uh, serves. Yeah, um, just your opening con a comment actually is interesting one because I feel like um, the element of emotion is actually taken out of this. And I think that's intentional uh, because emotion will actually get you killed. Uh, so from that perspective, I think, um, that is a, that is, is, um, uh, it's lacking, but I, I put a quote in from Shakespeare actually into the chat for you, but, uh, um, and, uh, and, uh, Titus Andronicus, um, you know, sweet mercy is the, is, is nobility's true badge of courage, courage it should have there. Um, so, uh, there is a truth to that. I mean, I think that there is certain types of, um, of, uh, well, I will say this earlier in the chat, in the book, they do talk about not destroying the, the, the infrastructure, uh, of the, of the, of the enemy. So, um, as a as a means to keep it functional so maybe maybe there is that element in there uh, slightly but i do see not much emotion in most of the text um david um uh, yeah and i think that the comment about um the weakness he's describing of too much. Uh, what, what was the text? It didn't say necessarily compassion, did it? It's what was it? Uh, it was described as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, over solicitude. Okay. So he's talked about previously that you have to be ready for the opportunities to present themselves, and you have to plan to make aggressive moves when the possibility arises. Now that's going to entail putting people directly into danger. And you do that in a minimal way because you're essentially with some compassionate, you know, basis going to wage a horror, you know, in the most quick and effective way to minimize the horror. But that means when it's time to attack the shore of Normandy, if you visualize the horror, you know, but you look at the weather and you make the determination because you figured out what has to be done in that. So it's, there can be a weakness of 
of hesitating at that moment because the weather will get worse, you know? Well, I like, um, and I did not, you know, I don't, my translation is on my phone and it conks out and I can't see the whole text. But anyway, yes, the solicitude, the over solicitude is a little different than the concept that I'm thinking of because that's where you're actually seeking approval to inflate sort of your own uh, flailing ego. Uh, <laughs> and uh, okay. I did not, I did not mean that. Okay, so so you know, here's the you're doing exactly what we were doing. We're struggling. We're, we're wrestling with what it could mean because we're not speaking the original Chinese in that context. So what could he? It couldn't be something as simple as just you know. So we have to say, well, it's got to be this balance because he's told us before, and here we are now. Yeah, thanks. Fun. Yeah, Anne's comment about the shame uh, related to what I would call trustworthiness nowadays in the modern understanding of honor is very interesting because in the Mencius, uh, you have the theories of the four seats. And uh, the four seats precisely are to be uh, capable of, uh, for example, of discernment between right and wrong. And if it's developed, it would become wisdom. And if you have the capacity for respect, if it's developed, it would be become valor. And if you have precisely the capacity of metaphysical shame and not the social shame, okay? Because once again, we can always have the social shaming to control people. But here for Mencius is a metaphysical seed of, of metaphysical shame. And if that metaphysical shame is rightly developed, uh, well, it becomes, a, a true sense of justice, okay? And that would be the true honor, if you want, the true trustworthiness that uh, you would match your deeds with your words. And here, uh, it would be the, the lower honor with, that is associated with the aristocratic uh, pride, precisely. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, in the lack or the, uh, the, the lower honor here that uh, the translator said uh, delicacy of honor that is a, a a weak honor if you want which is oversensitive to shame and not uh, the true honor of trustworthiness as Anne very rightly stressed so the one question i would actually uh um like to pose to you is that what is the relationship between honor and shame Okay. Because um, I think they're directly related to one another. Yes. Um, and I in a in a very uh, in a very deep way. Exactly. Because uh, let's start with the small one, okay, the aristocratic pride. Okay. So that honor would be uh, the pride associated with your lineage, with your power, with your wealth, with your person. But if you truly develop your metaphysical shame, okay, because for Mencius, you have four natural metaphysical seats, and one of those four are the metaphysical shame, meaning that you would not do something that you feel ugly. And if that metaphysical seat is rightly developed, it becomes a, an inner sense of justice that you would be capable, for example, to see everyone as fundamentally equal and not having their values uh, graded according to their lineage, their wealth and power, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But if it's not rightly developed, you can have that infamous aristocratic pride precisely that would be a weakness in the general because the opponent can play on that aristocratic uh, pride to make him angry or anxious and from those uh, disturbing emotions he can take wrong decisions for example so uh, uh, it's rooted in philosophy okay uh, that you have the metaphor one of the four metaphysical seeds is precisely that metaphysical shame that could go wrong or rightly develop or rightly nurture truly becomes an inner sense of justice yeah, I mean, and that's the essence of the emotion itself. 
actually, which is very important to recognize. Sometimes people look at shame uh, in one dimensional, shall I say, in the sense that it's either good or bad. Uh, and it's both good and bad. Uh, exactly. And, exactly. And so people don't necessarily recognize um, the importance of that uh, for somebody to be shameless. Uh, I've had a lot of discussions about that. I also think that um, it links uh, directly to um, to honor in the sense that uh, it is related to uh, how an individual values themselves. Uh, so that, you know, if you have no honor, then you really don't care. So there's that relationship between shame and honor that exists. Now, I think uh, when we covered honor a while back, uh, and um, with, we covered a book uh, with uh, Mortimer Adler with 102 Great Ideas, and he goes through all of the philo like different philosophers and their approaches, and honor is a topic that they cover. Uh, I think, uh, sorry to interrupt, I Please. think that, At that Adler would speak of honor in terms of a feeling of inferiority or superiority, if I remember. Um, I'm trying to remember myself now. Uh, I thought, well, he has a couple different explanations for what I read uh, about okay. it. But it that's interesting because I would suggest the following hypothesis, okay, to explain the different grade of honor, if I can say so. Please. Yeah. Uh, I think that is an honor which is grounded in the personality, okay? The personality is precisely your lineage, your wealth, your power, your net worth, your connection, etc. okay? What the Chinese call Mianzi, okay, because uh, you probably know the notions of face in Asia, East Asia, in China, okay. Well, there is two faces in uh, in uh, the Chinese concepts, okay. You have Mianzi, which is precisely your lineage, your connections, your wealth, your power, and your networks, etc. Okay, wealth and power. Uh, but uh, that kind of honor is precisely the small one, okay? The aristocratic uh, pride that could be very easily uh, taunted and wounded. Uh, but the higher form of honor, the one that Mencius was speaking in his book called, according to his name, his eponym book, Mencius, the Mencius, that higher honor is rooted in the metaphysical seed of. Uh, shame precisely and if that is rightly uh, developed it becomes not the aristocratic side uh, aristocratic pride i'm sorry but precisely the inner sense of justice okay so it is rooted not in the personality but in yourself uh, in awareness in your epistemological yeah, growth that's right okay and we can call it honor with a capital H, or we call it the inner sense of justice. I prefer to say the inner sense of justice because uh, there's no confusion possible with the other honor, which is more based on your personality or what the Chinese call mianzi. And that the higher honor, there's another name that, that is also translated as face in Chinese, uh, in English. And that the, the other word in Chinese that is also translated in English as face, but which is the higher honor or the inner sense of justice is called lian, okay? And lian is related to your epistemological growth, your understanding of uh, the fundamental equality of all human beings. And that is the true honor and which is manifested as Anne said very rightly as trustworthiness, for example, that mm -hmm. if you promise something to someone, uh, it would be your honor with a capital H to respect your word. And this is actually essential that something that Sun Tzu uh, had talked about um, a little bit earlier when he talked about uh, earning the loyalty of men of your of your uh, of your soldiers. Uh, if you do not have honor, if you're not trustworthy, if you're not uh, if, you, if you're not a person of your word or how you're going to execute, 
then people, the soldiers will not follow you. And I think that that's in chapter two, or maybe exactly. it's one. I think it's one uh, well, where he talks about winning. the. Yeah, so I, I think that this is something, you know, that's very deep um, because if you're talking about personal character and if you want people to follow you, then you, you well, need in any society, when the people realize that their princes or their leaders don't have honor, you have a big crisis of authority. Fundamentally, uh, yeah, big crisis of authority and trust in yeah. general. I mean, trust is the underpins of society. Yeah. I mean, not just in, but it's especially important in the military although Anne seems to be shaking her head and she disagrees is, but is this sort of an open forum at this point you know or um, we well let's we have our hands up for a minute or for a james, reason david james let's say james no, but it's been going you know it doesn't seem to be successive well no he wants to he's holding a dialogue with kwan yeah. and he, he is well, the if we're gonna if we are we gonna stay on that topic for a while or are we going oh, yeah, to, yeah we, i was we, gonna I'm stay on the same, same topic yeah. okay yeah. good let's good Good. I wanted to. Yeah, good. Okay, you're giving me the floor. Please. Uh, yeah, the uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Quan. That was really uh, great for you to mention those multiple uh, metaphysical dimensions of honor. And uh, I had the same idea in a different way. You know, the uh, the the protecting honor, as in saving face, uh, does tend to lead to uh, does have a really big downside. It could lead to pride. Uh, mm -hmm. And it can lead to shame. So, uh, so this is uh, that's a very nasty kind of outcome, in terms of like using honor as a self attribute in our, that needs to be protected uh, at all costs. And then the other idea is just like respecting honor as a as a social attribute. Uh, and it, what when you respect honor, it acclimates you to the ethics of other people. So in other words, other, other people might respect honor of one type or another. And uh, when you respect honor, you are kind of acclimating yourself to your fellow humans. So that's a, a much more positive side to me of honor, which I think you were, you were getting into. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the main thing that, that and, and I, I think these are, five fatal flaws, according to Sun Tzu, fatal, five fatal psychological weaknesses. And uh, I think we see these widely in society. And uh, like I said before, and I think if you don't pick up one of, if, if there's one of these you don't pick up, especially, I think it, need, it bears some meditation. If you don't get the honor bit, how it kind of like is uh, it can trigger in the wrong direction. It's a positive kind of like builder of societal ethics and it's a uh, but that it can actually result in negative outcomes in terms of like plugging it in uh, to a uh, feeling of superiority of self uh, so so it needs to you need to be able to attack each of these uh, psychological weaknesses from both sides and not sort of saying yeah 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 we need the commander to want to save the lives of all his soldiers. Yay. No, well, he has to be able to deploy troops. If he ever stops deploying troops, he has a war to which he's likely to lose. So, uh, you know, so you have to look at those negatives along with the positives. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, in, in this particular instance, he's talking about a delicate, this is the exact translation, a delicacy of honor, which is sensitive to shame. So, um, but you're right, there is a negative out, uh, aspect of that too. Uh, if you're essentially allowing the honor uh, being dictated to you and uh, externally, um, and it's not necessarily the, a code that ought to be followed, then that kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier with when not to follow the prince. But anyway, I, I was thinking more along the lines of um, Honor can actually lead you to act irrationally and unwisely. So that's that's a you know if in that sense it's actually uh, it can be um, considered a negative. Uh, so I, I mean, and so it, it, it's it's it requires a it requires wisdom, and this comes back to what Quan was talking about 
with linking, this is why it was important, what he was linking the cardinal virtues to each one of these five um, points that Sun Tzu was making. Because in ultimately, these, this, these are related to judgment. Um, and 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 um, courage and th and and other thing uh, all four actually of the virtues as as uh, uh, Quan had noted, um, but I think that that's an important point because it's also uh, these are the tactical aspects of um, of those virtues. Uh, James, are you done? Well, I was gonna I was gonna mention that this. Uh... This last idea that uh, of of the, the integrating your sense of honor with the sense of honor of others is an idea in uh, Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. I believe it's in uh, chapter book ten. Book ten of the Nicomachean Ethics treats that whole subject of where does uh, where does uh, honor come in uh, uh, and how does it relate to uh, the society in general and. Uh, not just uh, not just your own behavior, but uh, you know where where a person who is honorable actually is acclimated by the by the general population and so on and so forth. But it's a matter of acclimation. It's a matter of people become, being acclimated to each other. One person's honor being acclimated to the honor of the others as well. Mm. And that is handled by Aristotle and is, I think, very well. I think he handles it very well in the Nicomachean Ethics. Thank you for that, James. Um, great comments. Uh, David. All right. Um, so, yeah, I, this, I don't know the source of these is in the East or the West, but I think they've been recognized in both realms, in fact. Uh, um, and I, when you say cardinal virtues, the four cardinal, I don't know, is that the Confucius four cardinal? I don't, I don't know what that term four cardinal virtues. Uh, it's uh, it's the, the expression is used in the book written by Mencius, uh, called De Mencius, and Mencius was born in 372 BCE, and he died in 289 BCE. So it's in, in China somewhere. The four, uh, well, well uh, it's, it's written uh, 24 uh -huh. centuries ago. Okay, yeah, so, okay, so, uh, the, so, same uh, so the, Socrates had the same uh, issue, yes. and they were discussed in Platonic dialogues. They've, they've parsed the idea, and I think from those philosophers until modern times, the people who examine this seem to assert that a human being has to be capable of all, both, both positive and negative poles of these attributes and then to put them in the balance. And that's the means that we have to find to have the balance. Otherwise we're sociopathic or you know not adjusted or not performing to our maximum or not Eudamian. Are, are you talking uh, about so, golden mean almost like Aristotelian? Yes, or, yes. So, the so means, that's where, that, the that, mean. that, that, you know that's you know, when, when I hear the pride and shame or uh, actually it would be pride and um, humility. Uh, exactly. you know, what's the what's the, what's the middle that you would right. actually want to strike? So, and it's the same thing. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So and there's, always, there's always the question in the Socratic dialogues of whether what we're labeling as something is portraying it or is truly it. It reaches to the essential aspects of what we are claiming as present. Is this really honor? Is this really the highest social? behavior of social good of the honorable person, the one who can tell everyone what to do, who has all the power and is bossy? Oh, maybe not. Well, you know, so the, the Socratic questioning eliminates the unessentials to tear you down to the essential. Okay. And so when we come to um, these particular ones, like honor and shape, so we're respecting the attributes, one's personal attributes in one's actual being. The actual being, there's the psyche, which you could call metaphysical, and then the actions the person takes. And we're going to be judging both of those kind of in a unity and saying, are they in harmony with these ideal principles? And when we see a harmony, then that, that's what the true, the true aspect of these things are. So the honors that are given empirically, gold and material and things like that, they're fake. Mm -hmm. They can be 
They can be given to anyone anytime, it has nothing to do with the harmony of their soul and actions with the principle that's being represented by giving them these quote honors. Those are fake honors. So that's not what honor, so you're calling it a low honor or something like that. Okay, because it's not the true honor. The true honor is the harmony seen in the elevation of the person's, you'd say virtue. Their soul combined with their actions expresses their character. So that's the truth. When that's manifest, the, the, so the metaphysical and the physical are the same here. That's when you have true honor. And it's the same thing with shame. When they're misshapen, malformed, their behavior does not correspond. And their essential personal characteristics, even their body doesn't conform. To see it is shameful. You keep it covered. It's humiliating. So, but when it's in harmony, then it's true to its principle and you have this respect. So are we respecting the attribute that's being portrayed as a portrayed honestly and truly? That's the high, that's the harmony. And that's the positive value of the, not shame, but the pride of it. That's the balance. And it's not a pride that's overweening and becomes something else. So it's in that balance, right? So, the, yeah, I think I know East and West are in kind of dialogue on this, I think. Well, yeah, you know, in a way, you can answer this. If, are you, so, so you're saying, you know, you can be given gold, it can be taken away. Therefore, it's not necessarily a good in itself. So are you then saying that virtue is the only way to be harmonious? So you may be taking the word virtue as already the true combination you know, of the soul aspect and the actions, the capability to carry them out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That virtue is the ability to act on the honorable intention and have that intention because you have that understanding, right? So yeah, I can give you the Olympic gold, but when we find out, you know, someone finds out someone else cheated, you know, and they take their gold away, it's not enough. The true is the unity that's actual, you know, it's not hidden. And it wouldn't even be an honor if he even won because he oh, would have oh, to. They would, it's called an honor though. That's the problem. It's mistaken for honor. Yes, it's mistaken for honor. Yeah, yeah it's mistaken for honor. Okay, that's fair. All right. Maybe we maybe we should use the word achievement, okay? But uh, the word honor as an achievement, as a social as achievement uh, acknowledged by the society, uh, is a is a control legacy, okay? Honors with an S. Right, and it has to do with the public opinion, yes. secondarily, because they judge the universal. They can be wrong though. Because you can be honorable above their capability to understand, but it, it would be the public opinion if you know. So it should be the universal opinion that is what you are honored by, even if they don't know it. <clears throat> you internally, your soul has the harmony with that honor or the shame in the front of that that nobody even knows you murdered the king, but you know you know the shame because publicly it would be known and you would be humiliated if they knew. Yeah, but but uh, it's part of the epistemological growth or the personal growth. Okay, we uh, we we all know that self confidence is built by achievements. Okay, when we were kids or teenagers, we were proud of ourselves because we managed to achieve something in sports, in music, in school. Okay, it's part of the epistemological growth that we all went through. But Quan, what is called achievement is determined by your community and your environment, not necessarily some objective. Okay, so uh, you learn uh, what you should identify correctly as achievement and you begin as an adult to define what real achievement is, right? Yeah, Hopefully. right. I, I, I absolutely agree. It's part of the personal development of everyone. We're going to go to uh, Mark, who's been waiting patiently. Uh, so. Yeah, I just wanted to say I'm going to go soon. Oh, uh, okay, bye. Take care, James. Sorry, sorry, Mark. <laughs> no, Mark been sorry about that, Mark. I, not at all. I'm really enjoying the debate, and I'm practicing the virtue of patience. I mean, what <laughs> yes, <laughs> very, very well, very well. Thank you. I mean, honor... And that's not one of the fatal ones. Yeah, <laughs> we're honored to give you right. the opp opportunity. It's not, we're honored to give you that chance. Yeah, <laughs> too, too much patience obviously will lead to a miscalculation by the army, but that's another story. Very good. You know, honor 
we don't talk that much about honor, I think, in our society today. Where honor, where we really find honor is in robes, in black robes, where we address the judge and we say, yes, your honor, no, your honor. And I think that what was mentioned earlier in the debate, you know, how important this is that people who are leaders in society are respected, that is, I don't know if we would really call that honor or integrity. So we want our leaders to have integrity, but- How would example, you distinguish those two? Well, I think that integrity is internal. You say what you, you're, you do what you say you're going to do. Like Quan said, your words match your speech. But I mean, your, your speech matches your actions. But honor is external. And I think that recently, a couple of people, maybe David was touching on this, that honor comes from those around us. And they can take it away just as easily as they can give it. And they may give honor where it's not due, and they may not give honor where, where honor is due. So can I ask you a question? But because this is important for me to understand, I'm just trying to think about this properly. So would you say the function then would be uh, integrity and the outward uh, result would be your actions and honor? The form. Well, honor is something like justice is something we do. We are courageous. We are just. We can be wise. We can be temperate in terms of the four platonic cardinal virtues, you suppose Socratic, but honor is not one of them because when they compare the forms of life among the ancient Greeks, the life of honor was seen in Aristotle and others not to be as valuable as the life of justice or wisdom because the, the, the timocratic, because time is the Greek word for honor, we say the timocratic form of government is that associated with the aristocracy and those who only care about honor. So that's the way I'm kind of reading this, this number here, number four of the five. If you are to, a delicacy of honor, okay, so he's, if you're elevating your own honor too high and you're too sensitive about it, then you are sensitive to being shamed by other people when in fact, public opinion shouldn't matter to you. Right. You have to act. Right. That's I think that's correct. Yes, yes. That's very much correct in line with that. Yeah, I think that that's an accurate interpretation of that line specifically. Mark, would you also, uh, yeah. if the integrity, I, I think integrity can be entirely an internal self consistency and a unity of your actions and values. Yeah, in integrity means I'm one, integral. But honor is involves also what public opinion would be in the sense that if you were watching someone do this, you know, and you were in the public, have you have you done what should be done in that you you are you're acting in an honorable way, not just for yourself, which is what integrity may be. You may have integrity and wield it power over people. That's your kind of integrity, but honor, I think, has to entail the community in this, and, and you know, maybe not the community of MAGA people. I wonder, you know, I'm not saying that. I'm saying community of people who also can reflect the, yeah. the, the act like, that you're doing. And shame is not having, not having shame. You can't go to that level because you have to feel public approbation and recognize that it's significant to feel shame. You have to yeah. feel humiliation and honor is the opposite. You fulfill the community value. Yes. There's also honor among thieves. Mm. Well, they're forced into a community right. and they see themselves in a boundary enclosed. And within that, it's still the same feeling. Right. They know that they can trust you to do what you're saying. You know, that there's an underlying trust in that. You're fulfilling their, yeah, that's the way we treat each other. We won't snitch on each other and stuff like that. 
Yeah, and actually it doesn't work if you have no honor. <laughs> I mean, so uh, it's just misguided. Um, it's not necessarily virtuous. Uh, so uh, next up we have um, Anne followed by Jenny. Yeah, I wanted to riff off of uh, James' comment about some the missing sort of uh, characteristics that Sun Tzu points to in our society. And I, I think um, the one that, that troubles me greatly is that we're um, so e uh, quick to be insulted and get angry and um, accusatory and what have you. And I, again, I don't have the text in front of me. Um, but uh, I also, um, you know, that bothers me. Um, but uh, I wanted to say, you know, um, too quickly that um, David, gosh, it was something related that you mentioned. Oh man, <laughs> I'm so forgetful now. Um, yeah. We can come uh, back to you. Jenny's been waiting patiently. So. Yeah, okay, yeah, let's, yeah, let's move on. Hey, Jenny, please. Hey, Jenny. How you doing, Jenny? Hey, first of all, I say, wanted to say hello to you all. It's been a uh, while. It's um, very nice thank to hear you. Your voice. Enjoyed your conversations. Um, hi, Mark <laughs> and Joe. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I've been thinking of the word honor and the way, um, for example, the Japanese. Um, did they use? Oh was, wasn't it in the name of honor? Um, when they would do um, seppuku and harakuri. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So, um, and so it, when I think of that, it's like this, the word honor is just in my views, is like it has this negative connotation about it. Um, and um, I, uh, it's just, that just came to my mind. What do you think? I don't know. Um, yes, I mean, but then there's that element of shame, right? That's actually driving that. So yeah. if, if you think yeah. of it yeah. from that perspective, it's that you're not doing it because maybe it's the honorable thing it's maybe you're doing it because it's shame I, it's hard to say actually to know what each individual action was you know but um the reality is is that it would be shameful for you to come back um and so are you really doing it for honor or are you doing it because you'd be ashamed um so when david as i think it was david who said earlier that the word integrity is is more um, more important or uh, or has more a internal. higher position in terms of of uh, how it in terms of um, prior uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for any anyway I, I enjoyed what David said about the word integrity as opposed to versus honor. Well, I, I was following, I think, Joe, it's, uh, the idea that integrity was about sort of yourself in isolation, you know, forming yourself, your values and acting on your values that, you know, doing that is being one, be an integrity integral, a unit means being a whole. So being that, but then when you start to get more complicated, a layer on that of society and what it means to have an impact on society and reflecting what it does to other individuals, you know, you don't have shame when you're alone, but you have shame when you relate to other people. Or you have honor when you relate to other, you know, you can have integrity and respect yourself. But I think honor and shame are meant to reach out to when you're expressing your integral you, really your na naked you in front of other people, are you embarrassed or are you proud? Mm -hmm. so well, so it was you, David, who said the the word honor is outside, whereas integrity is inner. 
you know, within a, it, it, inner inner workings, right? I and so, that and honor, honor is also sows it into you, but from a more complex you, a you which involves a community. See, I mean, you know, I know the honor is also in you, but not not just you as an isolated, but you as a in a community and caring that the community behold what you beheld your action your meaning you know what are you in front of that community that's that's where honor is entailed i give mark a chance as you were about to speak mark no i just i just wanted to tell tell jenny that i was the one that try, was trying to say that <coughs> integrity was more internally driven and honor more externally bestowed and it could be wrong no i, I agree with you so it was you not david see i i agree with you mark um yeah i only have one thing to say jenny i'm honored <laughs> very good um but it's but it's a shame that uh Honorable um, Justice, uh, what, what's it? Who, what's his name? Who's been taking all these bribes from uh, politics? Uh, we're trying to avoid politics. It's, Clarence, it's not uh, Clarence actually. Thomas. You know, oh, Mr. Clarence, Honorable Clarence Thomas has been dishonored. Uh, anyway, I, had to, seven. I hold to Sri Khan's rules uh, with, when it comes to politics. As much as I can. Um, uh, Kwan. Um, I tend to I tend to agree very much with the word integrity too, because you know that I tend to explain things in terms of etymology, and integrity is from Latin intangere, meaning uh, to be complete. And what is complete here is the soul that is complete. So, and when you uh, decide from your soul your complete soul, uh, you are at the level of the individuality precisely, if, if I use psychodynamics uh, concepts. And when, uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes, we discussed very much about the fact that honor or shame is related to the relations with other in so society or in social context, uh, that is precisely the matrix making the personality, okay? Because once again, personality comes from persona okay meaning the mass the social mass uh, that we have and those social mass have been built or created through our social interactions so it's very normal that honor or dishonor or shame because dishonor is more or less a synonym of shame would always be in the social setting and that integrity or in the sense of justice would be something that is more from the complete soul that is more related to our epistemological growth or if you want the chinese make the distinction very clearly between the two kind of faces mianzi honor which is expressed in society or dishonor if you lose something or the public opinion uh, doesn't approve you and lian which is the complete soul your individuality giving you the, the right direction for what is truly in the justice or integrity. That's really, really well said. Thank you. Uh, Anne, did you remember what you were going to say? Thank you for that, Kwan. Well, oh, no, <laughs> just uh, I'm managing to kind of get sidetracked. I'm sorry, sometimes I, I have the ability to attend and multitask and other times student being tired, I don't. Well, yeah, I definitely agree with Quan that the, the origin of the word is the same as the origin of the word integer, and it means unified, single thing. And we can take off from that and use it in other ways, but we'll, we really need a way to talk about that basic concept. I think that you know, philosophical integrity. We're, we're getting down to that context-free idea of a person can be living the way they 
declare their living and want to live. And as much as they can do that, that's called integrity. It, and it doesn't mean, I saw your note, it doesn't mean devoid of the fact that there are other people. It doesn't mean devoid of the fact that they learned from their parents. You know, but it means that they're concerned with being what they say they're being and sticking with that and like even paying a price to do it. Right. That's the test, right? They'll stick together even when it's easier to, to veer. Anyway, Ginny's the uh, raised her hand again. Ginny, do you have a comment? Uh, if not, Quan. You know, I think I forgot to take my hand down. Sorry okay. about that. Good night, everyone. Good night, Jenny. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Jenny. Well, thank you for thank you for holding. No, any fun. This was a lot of fun. Um, uh, Quan. Sorry, I just forgot to lower my hand. <laughs> oh, okay. We've exhausted uh, the whole concept. The, well, I appreciate everybody staying, uh, especially I've taken away, like this was a good discussion. I know that it, it was uh, essentially inspired by one line, uh, but I really enjoyed uh, the insights that everybody brought, uh, especially discussing and thinking about the word integrity within this framework. Uh, of, you know, when we're talking about honor and shame and uh, much of the text that we're talking about, is, it's, you know, that there's, there is a um, element of honor or pride <laughs> that goes into uh, the art of war. Um, so uh, I think that this is a, a very helpful discussion for me personally. And I'm very appreciative to what everybody added. Um, and I did put a link to the discussion we had on honor. I really, I think it's just, if you put it on in the background, uh, it's very much worth listening to. Um, and uh, that was over three, I think that was right around, um, I think that was Memorial Day of 2019 uh, when the pandemic just started only a couple months after the pandemic had started. Uh, so uh, yeah, it, it's a great, it's a, it was a lot of fun, that discussion. Thank you, Joe, that was nice. Uh, and threw one little hand grenade into the chat. I think it's worth just, uh, so she, she said, by the way, who actually says I have integrity? Unless there's a question about an actual doubt. Sometimes, it's worth saying to explain to people that they're not seeing the whole story. Mm. You know, like, no, I didn't do something different now and something different now. I'm doing the same thing. Understand there's an integrity to the actions. You know, you're disputing someone's interpretation sometimes, Ann. Does that make sense? Anyway, so. Uh, it was just a thought. Plain language. I'm also, you know, taken back by the fact that Mark had lunch with Mortimer Adler. There you go. That could be daunting, but yeah. affirmative, very affirming. <laughs> it is. It's pretty awesome, Mark. Um, he said, how can we improve the educational system in this country? Was this like 50, 50 years ago? No, this was this was in uh, probably 86 or so. 60 and years ago. Van Doreen was there. Uh, all of the great books crowd. Mm. How can you how can we improve the educational system? Nobody said anything. I was the only student around the table. And I said, well, I think you have to pay teachers more. <laughs> Yeah, John Dewey didn't have the answer. It was actually pay them. But this was after, now it's kind of coming back to me. It was after a lecture he gave at the University of Chicago on the Trinity. And his lecture 
was, you know, was very theological. He was trying to literally give an explanation of the Trinity. <clears throat> and it was a really, there were hundreds of people there. And I remember at the end, nobody was asking anything. So I stood up and I said, Professor Adler, what an incredible talk, but with all due respect, isn't the Trinity a mystery? And if it's a mystery, then by definition, we can never figure it out really. Right. <laughs> you know, then I fainted. So I don't know what he actually responded. Yeah. That <laughs> You, you only get, the, you only get you, the video, so you get the answer, Mark. Now we're all in a mystery. Mark, so, Mark but I, you fainted? No, I, I was kidding about that. Answer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think what he said was he just kind of get launched into an abbreviated version of his talk. <laughs> yeah. Briefly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. It's essential that you not understand the following three things. That's it. So what was his point? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for the laugh. Oh, well. Where thank you, everybody, for staying and, and, and your time. I'm just going to go yeah. to, I'm going to announce some upcoming events that I think uh, you everyone might be interested in. Tomorrow is we're going to be mastering the art of self-training, which is actually a gets back to the idea of education that Mark was just talking about. Um, and actually the changes that maybe need to happen in education. So uh, that is tomorrow. Um, the Prophet by Khalil Gibran will be on Thursday this week, which um, instead of the Gospel of John. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, on love, on marriage, and on children. Um, and then on Friday, we'll be, uh, we'll be covering the uh, Jordan Peterson series on the Logos and Ephesus, uh, a visual presentation and discussion, which I think the people that will be presenting are Claire, Victor, and Roger, who are all um worth listening to uh and um uh, and the i would be uh, wrong for me not to announce the asian philosophies uh studying shuang uh on equality of things on the equality of things i don't know if that's jason or pin because i think pin led something like that last year um, hey, if, if you're partial to civilization, there's uh, the Chicago philosophy group, and it's also under the Scott and Dave high ontology group. Oh, okay. A discussion of Kenneth Clark's series on civilization. We're up to the fourth of the 13 in the sequence, and you can just pull right in, and we're discussing man, the measure of all things, the very beginning of the Italian Renaissance in terms of art. What time is that, Jason? Or, nine uh, nine o'clock Thursday. Nine o'clock Thursday in Chicago philosophy or Scott and Dave's high ontology. Yeah. And he's not high, he's not high, but it seems like he's high. Yeah, he's got a lot of energy. Um okay, well, uh thank you again, everyone. Um for staying. Thanks again. See you, Joe. Um, enjoyed everybody's company. Bye, Mark. Bye. 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 All right, take care. Apologies, Bye. Mark, if I was a little bit rough earlier. Not at all. Yeah, I was trying to get through the text. Not at all. Okay. Go okay. See you, man. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Have a good evening. Bye.